Good morning, everyone. First of all, thanks so much for being here. I understand that half a day on a Saturday uh, for uh, busy people and busy parents uh, is a lot. I hope you find it beneficial. Um, Sue mentioned engaging. What engaging means is you're going to do as much work with each other as I am going to talk to you. So uh, instead of lecturing you for three hours, we're going to have some exchange and then some interaction. So the first thing that you need to do is find one or two people that will be your learning partners today. One or two people that will be your learning partners, just make eye contact, say, you're it. So we'll be doing things like nudge a neighbor, we'll be getting up and twisting around, we'll be doing true-false tests, uh, all kinds of fun just to, to make the information flow and hopefully download a little bit. Finally, uh, the perspective I take is a neuroscience perspective. So we're going to look at ADHD not, in fact, as a behavioral problem, but in fact as a unique and different brain which in fact it is, and I'll, I'll show you that today. And that's really important in terms of at least my approach and most of, uh, I think, what the research is telling us about not just ADHD, but child development in general. What do kids need? Because even though I might have ADHD, I'm still a kid or I'm still a young person. And uh, sometimes all of the focus can be on the ADHD and, and the problems. And uh, we just want to remember to always stay balanced uh, as much as we can. We'll look at some specific ways to do that. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. Uh, interested in um, what you think about this. Uh, would you, you be interested in learning about where ADHD happens in the brain and why it happens, it, what's actually going on? Uh, receiving a menu, Ooh, why do I say menu? Um, I got a short time with you. Now you might think it's a long time, three hours, but for me it's very short. And um, I want you to leave with lots of stuff but I also recognize that can overwhelm you. So the way I frame that is think of it as a menu that you're gonna pick from and select from, just the things you like, right? So you wouldn't go to a restaurant and order everything on the menu, though depending on some of my more favorite restaurants, I'm tempted to, right? You're gonna pick from those. So as those interventions come, don't feel like, oh, I've gotta do all of this. Of course you don't. Uh, they're just to give you some ideas what might work in your context, your family, your world. But if you'd be interested in ideas, exercises, strategies, and I say powerfully support, uh, because they're research supported, evidence supported with ADHD. Uh, also, have a little fun and get out on time. If any of those things interest you, raise your hand, say, I'm in. I'm in. All right, good, we're on the right track. All right, your materials. So you have the workbook, okay, and that'll be the primary uh, piece that we're going through uh, today. The workbook is for the full six hour session of this. So that's a disclaimer that we may not to get to every single thing, but I'm going to show you if you want the whole six hour version, how to get it, right? So that'll be uh, in, in later in the presentation. And then uh, this newsletter from Brainwaves, that's a free e-newsletter that my organization does. Uh, there's always articles about kids, child development, uh, youth development, and the brain. And so what does research tell us? But it's not like a neuroscience study. First time I actually tried to read a neuroscience study myself, it was like stern cement with my eyelashes. Wow. Uh, and so what I've tried to do over the years is translate it into the language that, that parents and teachers uh, can use effectively. That's what's in the newsletter. Uh, if you're interested in getting that, it comes free. No salesman will call, and your email's not given to anyone else. Um, empathy card. Uh, so that's a little card uh, that we're going to utilize later on uh, as an activity. This is particularly effective with your kids about fourth or fifth grade or older. If your children are that age, I'll, I'll show you how to use the empathy card. Index cards I'm going to give you as we do various activities. And then uh, finally, your brain pen. Isn't that cool? I hope everybody got a brain pen. Those are our materials. All right, here's our itinerary. We're going to look at why take a brain perspective? Why would that be meaningful at all? And why do I think it's so important that if you live or work or engage with uh, brains uh, with ADHD, it's so important to understand the, the brain perspective. So we're gonna start with that. And then, interestingly, one of the best questions is, where does it happen? It happens in a place. So ADHD happens in a place in the brain, and when you understand that's what that part of the brain does, and you understand ADHD works there, uh, that, I think, can, can provide tremendous insight uh, into what you see and what you're trying to help and support and also what you're trying to promote. Because as all of you know, 
uh, because I assume you wouldn't be here if you didn't have some exposure to an ADHD brain. There are some real strengths with an ADHD brain, some real strengths, and uh, we want to make sure we look at those. And so what is it? And when we look at what is it, um, we're going to see what, let's say, uh, tradition says it is. What's tradition? Well, as honestly as I can say it, tradition is money. In other words, to get paid for providing treatment or services for ADHD, ADHD has to be designated uh, in what's called the DSM-5, now five, Diagnostics and Statistics Manual. What the heck is that? That's like an encyclopedia of different mental health conditions that uh, service providers, helpers, counselors, physicians, psychiatrists, etc., they have to identify, i.e. diagnose, from that manual ADHD in order to get paid for and reimbursed. And uh, that's a good thing. We want them to get paid and we want them to help us. The problem is, if you're only looking at that system, ADHD becomes overwhelming because it's enormously uh, biased in the sense that it's negatively focused. It talks solely uh, about the problems and about none of the benefits, and uh, that can really get us on a track that's very problematic for our youth or our child. So looking at a variety of ways of how ADHD is described in terms of what it is, and then, uh, of course, the primary reason we're all here is what do we do about that? What can we do about that? Okay, so that's where we're headed. Now, um, music, when you hear music, that means usually for a presentation is short, we're on break. Uh, so when you hear the music, that means get up out of your chair. Uh, why do I want you to get up out of your chair? Um, because when the bum is numb, the brain is the same. <laughs> chimes. So you'll hear these. And so as we do our engagements, and you hear the chimes, that means just bring your conversation to a close. Uh-oh, big one. Train whistle. <laughs> that means... I'm either about to or I just said something profound. Because my audiences don't always know when I've said something profound. So I kind of have to cue you, right? So train whistle only goes off a few times, but that's like, that's the big idea today. Don't miss that one. Okay. Joke of the day. We've got to start with the joke of the day. Why? The state that your brain is in, what's called the emotional state that your brain is in, there's 13 of them uh, generally throughout the day. Only about four of them are good for learning. Uh, one of those is humor. So uh, I really like to start the day with a joke, get our brains ready to go. And then we've got to get your brains primed to go and we'll have a little brain test, your first opportunity to use that fellow brain. All right, so here's our joke of the day. Get ready, because I'm going to be here till noon. <laughs> Why did the ninth grader return her math book to the teacher? Why did the ninth grader return her math book to the teacher? It had too many problems. Da -da -da -da, till noon. All right. With your learning partner, you've got 30 seconds to answer this question. The sundial is the timepiece with the fewest moving parts. What time of, type of timepiece has the most moving parts? The most moving parts. 30 seconds. Go. And our answer is, that is, the hourglass. Oh. <laughs> now, there's a method to my madness here. Did you hear that collective, oh? Mm -hmm. Why does that happen? Because what the question does is kind of point you towards something like really new, right? Highly uh, modern, uh, maybe space age uh, type of stuff. And what we find is, in fact, it's just the opposite. Uh, it's ancient, uh, ancient. And um, I'd like to suggest to you that ADHD is a little bit that way. In other words, sometimes ADHD is the type of thing that can let us uh, lose sight of the ancient. What do I mean by the ancient? Kids are still kids. Young people are still young people. Family are still families. Um, and, and the ADHD, if it becomes too much of the focus, really interrupts with those basic fundamental, we've known them for thousands of years, needs uh, to be seen, I call it, to, to be seen, to be recognized, to be loved, to feel that you're capable, 
and to feel that you have a contribution to offer rather than you're just the one always causing problems. Um, and remembering that uh, fundamental piece is I think the most important part, despite all we're gonna learn about ADHD. All right, very quickly, why do I take this brain focus? Well, how brains are similar or different is really at the heart of uh, ADHD. And it's the core, uh, core of approach that, that uh, we take. So we try to make neuroscience understandable and actually really exciting. And I hope there's some aspects of it today that you find uh, exciting uh, about ADHD. Most importantly, the brain's involved in everything that you do, no exceptions. Consequently, everything that those you love, you live with and work with do. In other words, there's no more relevant topic on the planet, I believe, than understanding how human brains work because it'll make you better at everything that you do as a parent, as a partner, uh, in the workplace, uh, et cetera, by understanding uh, how, how they work. And I like to say the brain's everywhere these days. So I'm in my 15th year of teaching uh, about the brain and uh, I started collecting these. Some of you know Newsweek is no longer even published. But um, we're fascinated by the human brain and have been so for a long, long time. But it's probably only the last two decades that we've really understood deeply, at a much deeper level, how the brain really works. Why? Technology, like everything else in our lives. Functional MRIs, PET scans, SPEC scans, really have um, revolutionized and oftentimes turned upside down what we understand uh, about our brains. And so kids, babies, um, uh, memory, if you're getting my age, uh, all these things are very relevant to us um, in how the world works. So in terms of ADHD, one of the biggest messages I'd like uh, to make sure I communicate with you today is because of that DSM piece that I talked about earlier, ADHD is often described as this, the most common behavioral disorder in school-aged children. That's not really accurate. Um, because it's all in how you measure. Now, you could say it's accurate in terms of the behaviors reported in school that send a kid to the office or result in other type of matters are ADHD-related behaviors uh, part of that. In some schools, they are. But what it is factually is it's a brain condition. In other words, it's a unique brain in terms of both structure and function. Structure and function. What do I mean by unique? It's different from a brain that doesn't have ADHD. That, that's all it means. But this is a brain condition, not a behavior condition. And in fact, as we go through today, I hope you'll see that it is a, it is a brain condition with very predictable behavior outcomes in certain contexts. What do I mean by certain context? Well, you probably know this better than I, if you, if you live or love an ADHD uh, human being that in some context that ADHD is not a problem at all. You don't recognize it's there. You're, you're not thinking about it for a little while because of what your child or young person is doing or where you're at. But in other contexts, i.e. school, it seems it's almost constantly uh, an issue. And there's a reason for that uh, that we'll talk about and uh, we'll look at. So it's a brain condition. So if we understand what's happening in that brain, I think we see ADHD from a different perspective. <clears throat> all right. Now, we're going to have to use the room a little bit, but trust me, this is a lot of fun. So if you put everything down in your hands, stand up and push in your chairs. It gives us about almost 10% more room in the room. <clears throat> and for this activity, ideally, you'll need a partner. And if you and your partner can uh, uh, be um, where you can stand back to back, look over your shoulder, and see the screen. So back to back, look over your shoulder, see the screen. So this is called whip around. And especially with a Saturday morning activity, um, it works really good. So hopefully you, you chose a partner that looks really smart. That'll be a distinct advantage here in a moment. Uh, with your back to backs, I should have said, you don't have to be touching backs. You can give yourself a little bit of space. Maybe about, think about a foot between your backs. Excellent. All right, this is how it's gonna work. I'm gonna put true false questions up there about ADHD. First thing you're gonna do is you're gonna decide if you think the answer is true or false. If you think it's true, you're gonna go like this, right up against your chest, just a big T like that. If you think it's false, you're gonna cross your wrist like this. All right, and then the most important part, wait till I say whip around. And when I say whip around, literally you're gonna whip around and show your partner your answer. Oh, this isn't even the fun part yet. Here it comes. 
If you and your partner have the same answer, both true or both false, you're gonna celebrate. Woo! -hoo! We got it right! But if one of you has true and one of you has false, you're gonna be despondent. Ha! Oh, one of us is wrong, I'm sure it's you, but it still sucks. Okay? Why? Believe it or not, your brain is gonna remember these answers better when you emotionally over-exaggerate your response. It's really a lot of fun, all right? So quickly, without hurrying, turn to your partner and explain the whip around rules, okay? And a group of three will work. You do it like a triangle. All right, any questions? All right, so you gotta be in your back-to-back -back stance. Now, when you whip around, be careful about the tables and chairs. You certainly can move into the aisle if you're more comfortable. All right, here comes our first question. Remember, don't whip around until I tell you. When you first see the question, you're just gonna make your answer yourself. Girls are more likely than boys to have ADHD. Ready, whip around. Yeah. Pretty good, pretty good. All right, that answer is false. In fact, currently it's almost just under three times as many boys as girls, just under. So for many years it was at least twice, now we're close to, to three times um, as much. All right, back to back again. Here we go, remember, put that emotion into it. ADHD is the most common behavioral disorder diagnosed diagnosed in school-aged children. So not my example reported to the office, but diagnosed. What do you think? Get ready. Whip around. Yeah, that's true. Now, I like to do that because see how this works? Like the first one was pretty easy. Most of you knew it. So we had a really good, yay! But the second one's kind of like, yay. Right, not quite as much. And so when you're doing this, you can tell like, how comfortable people feel like this is the right answer, or maybe it's the right answer. All right, here we go, another, another one. Number three, back to back. ADHD goes away by age 21. Ready, whip around. <laughs> so, this one's really interesting because the research is all over the board on this one. So, um, how, much, how uh, durable, so to speak, ADHD is as a condition varies greatly in the research. Varies greatly in the research. And one of the reasons is, one of the theories I think is, is probably most accurate, is because by the time you get to adulthood, you've spent most of your growing up life adjusting, adapting, right? Changing in order to minimize right, the problems or symptoms. So it might look like you don't have it anymore, but it's just that you've had lots of practice managing it. Um, and so it becomes harder uh, to look at, though we'll see in a minute the brain scans are helping us um, be able to determine if you have uh, enduring, I call it ADHD, into adulthood and um, at what level, at what level. Okay, we got one more, one more. ADHD directly impacts intelligence level. That means IQ, IQ. What do you think? Ready, whip around. All right, that's false. That's false. So um, there is no um, correlation between ADHD and IQ level in terms of IQ level being different than the general population. Um, some have argued over the years and show statistics that in fact it's just a little bit the opposite. In other words, that, that ADHD, uh, if you have an ADHD diagnosis, you're more likely to be just a little above average in terms of IQ score. Um, though, uh, as you know, scientists uh, live to disagree um, that's what they do. We're, we're happy that they do it, and there's not a, a general uh, agreement on that. Hey, give your partner a nice high five. Say, thanks a lot. Okay, where is ADHD? Where is ADHD? Kind of the fundamental um, piece. So if ADHD is a brain condition, okay, Frank, where in the brain is it? Well, it's in this wonderful place in the brain called the frontal lobes. Frontal lobes. So, funky name, uh, but frontal simply means up here. 
up here uh, in the forehead area. It is the largest um, identified organ in the brain. It's the largest. It's also, in terms of human development, it's also the last um, part of the brain to have developed in human beings, and it's the part that distinguishes us uh, from just about every other living thing. So we're not the biggest things on the planet, elephants, polar bears, etc., a lot larger than us. We're not even the strongest on the planet. Uh, depending on how often you work out, um, it could be pretty puny in terms of strength. Nonetheless, human beings not only uh, dominate the planet, they change the planet. How does that happen? Because we have frontal lobes. Uh, more advanced than any other animal. And that's where ADHD uh, is different in terms of how the frontal lobes operate. So we're going to visit this a couple of times uh, today, but these are just a couple of things that happen in the frontal lobes. And you'll hear this described a couple of ways in, in news, in literature, when you read articles. So frontal lobes, frontal, again, just meaning in front of the brain, lobes, because there are two of them. There's one in your right hemisphere, there's one in your left hemisphere. So you have a left hemisphere lobe, a right hemisphere lobe, and they're in front. You also hear this called prefrontal cortex, prefrontal cortex. There they're talking about a very specific part of the frontal lobe. So cortex is a Latin term that means rind or bark. So it's just like the orange rind, bark on a tree. It's the outermost. So if you literally went right behind your skull bone, your forehead bone here, a little less than a quarter inch thick, you would hit your prefrontal cortex. Seven layers of cells uh, that are there, and they do some of the highest level processing that the brain does. Highest level processing that the brain does. So uh, it's interesting as we grow and as we advance as human beings, our brain continues to grow forward. So those, that prefrontal cortex, in essence, is one of the most um, important and smartest parts of us, so to speak. Okay? So you hear it called free prefrontal cortex. Lastly, executive function skills are the things that happen in the frontal lobes. Executive function skills are coordinated. Uh, they happen uh, through the function of the frontal lobe. So those are three terms, frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex, executive function skills, all kind of referencing the function of this part of our brain. Look at that list, right? Is this not nirvana? Is this not the promised land? Uh, this is what we want, right? In kids, why we have schools, what we're looking for in parents. First, we want impulse control. We all have impulses to do something else, be somewhere else, think about something else, uh, et cetera. But we know that in order to work, in order to parent, in order to do just about anything, we have to manage those impulses all right, until the appropriate time to do that thing comes. So I like to talk about this topic uh, in other workshops called extraordinary mental health. Extraordinary mental health. And there are seven components to that. And component number one is doing things when you don't want to do them. That ability to do things when you don't want to do them. Now, sometimes that's called persistence. You know, sometimes that's called uh, focus. Uh, sometimes that's just called, look, grow up, put your big boy pants on and go to work. But doing things we don't want to do because we know doing them is going to lead what? To a long-term outcome. That's a, a good one. Okay? So that impulse control one is a significant, significant element uh, of the executive function skills. Organization of your thought and action. Time orientation, the ability to track the passage of time without a device. The ability to, to track passage of time without a device, i.e. in your head, in your head, called time orientation. Reading social cues, facial expression, tone of voice, body language is an executive frontal lobe function. Accurately predicting the consequences of your behavior, sometimes referred to as cause and effect thinking. If I do A, B is probably going to happen, will absolutely happen, more likely to happen, etc. Mm -hmm. And maybe that one arguably is the most important one up there, um, some would argue, because being able to predict if I do this, this will happen, or if so-and-so does this, this will happen, um, is maybe one of the most important uh, ones up there. And finally, goal achievement. Notice not goal setting. 
Uh, our brain automatically sets goals uh, if you don't set them out in writing. Is it good to set them out in writing? Absolutely, uh, because you focus on it even more. But if you don't do that, your brain will set those goals anyway. You already have goals for the rest of the day, the rest of the weekend. Um, what you got to do to get ready for Monday, that happens all the time. This one is about goal achievement or goal-directed persistence, sticking toward a goal despite obstacles. Despite obstacles. And all of those are frontal lobe functions. Right? Have executive function skills. So if, go back to that list real quickly, if our issue is in the frontal lobes, all right, many of you can see that, that many times ADHD is described right, as uh, compared to non-ADHD brains of the same age, maybe not having the impulse control. Uh, that other kids have, maybe not having the organizational skills other kids have, uh, etc. And uh, that's often true because this is where uh, ADHD occurs. Right? This is where ADHD occurs, which is why I emphasize it's a brain condition, not a behavior condition. But because of the difference in the brain, you see some behaviors, some of which are problematic, uh, which, which I think we can easily overfocus on, some of which are strengths, which we probably don't focus on enough. Um, but it's a brain condition, that's where it is, and so those are the things that are going to be impacted. All right, now, we got to learn a little bit about brain chemistry to understand, well, what's actually different uh, in those frontal lobes. There are two things uh, very different in the frontal lobes. Number one, size. Size. So, in ADHD, commonly, the frontal lobe is smaller than same age kids without ADHD. But it's not stunted, it's not uh, malformation, it's nothing like that. It's simply smaller. Simply smaller. So we begin to see maybe not such a surprise that these things um, like impulse control, organization, etc., might be different if, if the capacity um, is smaller compared to kids your same age. The second thing that's different is chemistry, is chemistry. And that's what we're going to learn here uh, real quickly, but um, an important feature. Okay? So I want to talk to you about four chemicals, and they all uh, are going to impact your child, and they all, in fact, impact you. The first one is called cortisol. I say, cortisol's, uh oh uh oh problem here. This is your stress hormone, your stress hormone. That's why I call it uh-oh. So when your brain's worried about something, right, consciously or unconsciously, uh, it's afraid, uh, we call that stress. And how your brain makes sure you know that there's a threat out there, that it's concerned about something physically, emotionally, etc., is it gives you some cortisol. And it kind of goes, uh oh, problem over here, Frank, take a look. Depending on how big your brain perceives the threat is how much cortisol you get. So there are what, mild stressors? Hey, for some of you, being here today is a mild stressor because uh, of the things you're not getting done at home or what you typically do on Saturday, but hopefully not overwhelming. But then there are real major stressors, right, where your brain literally can't think of much else. And that's because there's a lot of cortisol that you're given. What does your brain want you to do? It's giving you cortisol to make you act to remove the threat. Let me say that again. Your brain gives you cortisol, stresses you to get you to act, to eliminate or escape from the threat. So cortisol is intended to be really powerful and to get you to take action. Okay? Now, if you can't take action, I mean like really serious stress, and you can't take action, there's nothing you can do about it, then the brain will also give you adrenaline. And this is adrenaline used like jet fuel on a bonfire, right? Where, where cortisol is very uh, like compelling, I say. You know, you feel it. You've you got to have that do so. When you get adrenaline, it's mandating you do something now. Act now. No more waiting around. That combination of lots of cortisol and adrenaline is what uh, therapists and psychologists call trauma. Neuroscientists call it distress. They have normally extraordinarily high levels of cortisol and adrenaline. Now, on the other side, we have serotonin. Serotonin is your chemical of serenity. Serenity. Why do I call it serenity? Well, what it means is uh, it's, it's mostly about your social world. 
your social world. Your relationships uh, are pretty good. You are uh, cared about, uh, you're loved. Uh, you love others and care about them. You feel part of a team, a family, a group, a classroom, uh, a school, etc., a community. And you're, uh, as I mentioned earlier, feel capable, capable, and you make a contribution that's somehow recognized. All of those things are constantly monitored by your brain and affect your level of serotonin. Serotonin. That's why families are so vital and so important. Uh, because that's a lot of where much of our serotonin comes from. Now, it's also true, because I know some of you are there already, that's also where a lot of your cortisol comes from. <laughs> right? Uh, but we need that serotonin uh, also. Interestingly, low serotonin, we call it, when your serotonin's too low, that's called depression. And many scientists believe that depression is the brain's signal that something major in your social world is, is not right. It's off. It needs to be paid attention to. Finally, dopamine. Yo, that felt good. I like that. That's pleasure. That's joy. That's ecstasy. That's the chemical you get for that. Um, and dopamine is at the root of uh, all of uh, the brain's addiction issues. So why? Because what a intoxicating chemical does is automatically, um, instantly increase uh, your dopamine. Your dopamine. So that's why we say things like uh, high. Uh, you know, you get high. Well, what that means is lots and lots and lots of dopamine. Some chemicals produce dopamine at such a high level, they're called supra-physiological, meaning you can't find that level of dopamine in regular behavior. You can only find it through the chemical. All right. So, what's the point? The point is those three chemicals in particular, and hopefully we don't get too much adrenaline, Hopefully we're not in trauma, but some of your children could have had or may have trauma experiences in the future. Someone they love or care about die, separation from people they love or care about, other types of issues. But the three are really important. Why? We're going to see in a minute that cortisol wreaks particular havoc on the ADHD brain. In other words, the ADHD brain is a little more vulnerable to the impact of cortisol than a non-ADHD brain. And the practical aspect of that is simply this. Using in your face, straighten up this kind of language, you're in trouble kind of approaches are typically going to make it impossible for your ADHD brain to comply with what you're wanting them to do, and then you're going to punish them for that. Okay? It's particularly susceptible to cortisol. In other words, cortisol disables the ADHD brain at a greater level. So, where is anxiety between those? Like, which of those chemicals really. Cortisol. Yeah. So low level anxiety or, or kind of ongoing anxiety, daily anxiety, typically is your baseline cortisol is slightly elevated, maybe maybe 3% to 5%. Um, and so it's not overwhelming, but it's kind of always there. Uh, and then as you go up, higher and higher anxiety. So yeah, anxiety is a, is a different word for stress. And stress is cortisol level. Great question. Good insight. All right. So that's cortisol. Serotonin is often ignored here. Um, all kids, all kids, and I would say especially ADHD kids, have to be loved. They have to be seen. They have to be cared about. They have to be, they have to feel that they're capable and uh, that they make a contribution because every brain needs that. They need those four things. They must have them. If not, emotionally, they're really going to struggle. And when they struggle emotionally, they get stressed. And when they get stressed, then as when you and I get stressed, it's really hard to do the things that ADHD brains are demanded to do so much. Concentrate, focus, pay attention, learn, accomplish, goal, right? Persistent steps. And so they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. Finally, dopamine, in addition to the size of the frontal lobes, dopamine is the chemical that is dysregulated in ADHD. Dysregulated. What is the practical means of that? That you need more stimulation from the external environment to get the same amounts of dopamine than, say, your non-ADHD friends or classmates. And this is why sitting still, uh, being in environments with little stimulation are so difficult for ADHD brains. Because even normal stimulation is typically not going to be them enough 
Not going to be enough for them to feel what? Regulated. Normal. Feel. I'm fine. They need more stimulation from the environment, typically. Typically. And that stimulation comes in a lot of different forms, uh, as we'll see as we go on. All right. So here's one of my favorite slides. In fact, it's so important. We got to blow the train whistle for the first time. <laughs> this is so important. So think of this as a teeter-totter or a seesaw. I, I grew up in Nebraska. We called it a teeter-totter. I came out here and talked about teeter-totter, and people looked at me like I had three heads. You mean a seesaw? I said, seesaw? Well, that kind of name is that, right? But this is how it works. Your brain, my brain, their brains. Okay? All brains work like this. The two sets of chemicals that we saw here, they don't play well together. <laughs> they don't play well together. What does that mean? When your cortisol and adrenaline go up, you get stressed, you get worried, you get criticized, you get in trouble automatically, automatically, serotonin and dopamine decrease, right? Teeter-totter. They decrease and it's automatic. So the higher, higher, higher you are stressed, the more anxious you are, it's really hard to feel okay, isn't it? To, to have that serenity feel. And it's really hard to be dancing on the tabletop like Pee Wee Herman to tequila, right? Uh, no dopamine, no serotonin. Why? They automatically decrease. But the opposite is also true. If you increase serotonin and dopamine, you automatically decrease cortisol level. So practical example of this, exercise. Exercise, it's why exercise is such a great stress management tool. Why? Because it will automatically increase dopamine and serotonin, which means your cortisol is going down, even if what's stressing you is still there. So if you have a very stressful job, you come home from work, you do dinner, you get on the treadmill, you know you're going back to that job the next day, you're still going to feel more relaxed and more calm and less stressed after getting off that treadmill because this is automatic. And when I say automatic, I want you to think unconscious because many of the things that we do to change our teeter-totter are unconscious, habitual. Uh, we do them automatically without thinking. So do your children. So do your children. So you might think about when you get really stressed, your stress level is real high, what's your go-to? What's your go-to? What do you do? What do you do? What do you ingest? <laughs> what are your behaviors, right? So understanding that um, things like nicotine, so vaping, very popular among youth now, one of the reasons it's so popular is vaping is one of the fastest ways to de decrease your anxiety because nicotine does that. Okay? And that's why human beings have used nicotine hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. Nicotine works. The primary problem has been the delivery devices, right? Cigarettes and cigars and burning it and inhaling the smoke, and we don't know about vapes yet. But why do human beings insist on using it? Well, some people tell me because it's addictive. It is addictive. But it's also be, you, you don't just do it because it's addictive. You do it because it makes you feel better. Okay, so Juuls, J-U-U-L, if you haven't heard of them, are the most common way that our young people now are getting their nicotine. A Juul looks like a thumb drive, and it's got a little um, liquid container uh, that you pop into it. comes in grape and grapefruit and cherry and different flavors, and it's about two and a quarter packs of cigarettes worth of nicotine uh, in, that, in that little, uh, it's about this big. So what kids do is uh, they, they take it, they go into the bathroom stall at school, a couple of quick hits, and they've got enough nicotine for certainly in the next class, an hour and a half, two hours. And then the vape, vapor is gone, doesn't smell, and then the vapor is gone before it reaches the top of the uh, stall. Why? They're what we call self-medicating, and they're self-medicating this. So when their stress gets high, right, they do something that'll bring their serotonin and dopamine up lower their cortisol, and that changes their teeter-totter. See it? And you and I do it too. You and I do it too. Um, we probably justify ours a little better. So what are some examples? Caffeine. Caffeine. There is a coffee shop on every gosh darn corner, isn't there? Um, why? Because caffeine um, also influences this uh, a little bit. Now, nicotine and caffeine, not a lot. You get into 
other chemicals, and you've got more in an influence, right, on the teeter-totter. So uh, chocolate. Chocolate will up, up increase your baseline dopamine level by 150% if you uh, have chocolate as a treat. In other words, this doesn't happen if you eat it every day. I know, that's a bummer. <laughs> Cocaine will up your baseline dopamine level 400%. 400%. Your dopamine level will go up 400% by ingesting cocaine. Methamphetamine will change it 1,500%. And that's what I mean. Both cocaine, methamphetamine, those are super physiological. There's nothing you can do out there in the real world that will give you that much dopamine. And so those are enormously highly addictive. Why do I tell you this? Because I want you to understand that the drive for dopamine, okay, exists in all of us and it's really powerful and those people that you love who have low dopamine to begin with because their brain doesn't metabolize it as well okay, are going to have even a stronger drive even a stronger drive for what for things that make them feel better for things that up their dopamine okay? and whether that's video games or whether that's uh, outdoor activities whether that's a lot of things are related to screens why because they're fast they're easily acceptable, they're cheap, um, uh, almost all kids have them now, and they work immediately, and they work immediately. And so uh, thinking about that can be helpful. Finally, for many of us, it's comfort food. And that term comfort comes from the fact that it gives you dopamine, it makes you feel better when you eat it. And you might know intellectually, right? I don't need this, I shouldn't need this, I don't need right, this food or this extra beer or this glass of wine or whatever, but you have it anyway because it makes you feel better despite intellectual knowledge, which tells us what? Even as adults, this emotional seesaw is much more powerful than intellectual knowledge. Intellectual knowledge. This is the primary motivator of most of us. Of most of us. And it takes lots of frontal lobe power to overcome these drives, these drives, right? So that's why I spend so much time on it, because uh, you can kind of get a sense of what's going on. All right, my frontal lobe, where all these great things are supposed to happen, is a little bit smaller. It's not a lot smaller. A little bit smaller. And then dopamine, which regulates me and, and makes me feel good and gets me motivated and excited, mm, doesn't metabolize, meaning my brain cells don't burn it in the same way. And consequently, I need more. It's like I have less dopamine, so I need more stimulation to feel right. To feel right. All right. So, <clears throat> frontal lobe regions a little bit smaller. And then, why are they smaller? It looks like that oxygen and glucose just aren't burned at the same rate. Just aren't burned at the same rate. What's glucose? The sugar made from the food you eat. So no matter what kind of food you eat, your brain breaks part of it down into glucose, which is a type of sugar, and that's what feeds your cells. And then proteins, uh, like fix your cells and make your cells bigger, etc. cetera, but um, you're fed, your energy comes from glucose. And so there's a metabolism, I call it a burning, like gasoline in a car. And oxygen that you breathe is metabolized by your cells, so is glucose. So in the frontal lobes, of an ADHD brain, that metabolism is different. It's different. It's not as efficient. It's like putting the wrong kind of gas in your car. It'll still run, but it's just not efficient. You get kicks and starts, uh, etc. Right? And that creates some things in the brain that um, are, are different in a problematic sense, depending on context, but it also creates some things that are an advantage uh, in, in another context. And then that low dopamine production or metabolism is a huge one, is a huge one. So let's look at these brain scans, and I think it'll bring all of this together. Um, so what's a spec scan? Single photon emission, I can't remember the C, tomography is the last part, can't remember what the C stands for. Some really, really smart people <laughs> all right, created this. And so you inject this isotope in that is going to show up on an MRI, all right, it's going to be uh, uh, metabolized in the brain and then show up on an MRI and what it's showing is high metabolism areas. So it's literally representing how efficiently and how high the brain is burning oxygen and glucose. Okay, that metabolism. When it's high, it's very bright and it's very smooth. Bright and smooth. The colors mean something different that 
that's unrelated to our topic today. Brightness and smoothness is what we're after. Finally, your brain is seldom, uh, if ever in life, 100% on. Right? It uses the parts it needs to use for a particular context because it's very conservative. It doesn't like to waste time or energy. So you'll see parts that are darker right, or are a little bit what we call scalloped. So what's this? This is a picture as if the MRI camera is right underneath my chin. And so my frontal lobe is right there. Frontal lobe is right there at the top. This is where uh, the, most of the what are called emotional parts of our brain called the limbic system. This is our cerebellum. These are our language areas, our temporal lobes over here. There's the right hemisphere, just looking at the right side of your brain. There's the left hemisphere, and that, that's that cortex, that very top covering on the brain, really related to intelligence and thinking and conceptualization and all that really high-level stuff we do. Okay? So these are considered healthy because we have lots of smoothness all throughout. We have, we have a couple of uh, issues uh, you know, under metabolism here, uh, but we've got generally lots of good stuff going on. So no brain is completely smooth or completely bright. We all have different issues. But here comes ADHD. Okay, so ADHD, you'll see, has golf balls. Where? Right in the frontal lobe. What does that mean? Is that missing tissue? No, and please don't make that assumption. Oh, your brain's smaller because you got these golf ball size of tissue missing from your, no. But what it's saying is the metabolism of the neurons in that part of the brain right, is much slower and it appears as holes right, is how it shows up. But it means slower metabolism. Now it's not metabolism everywhere in the brain is slower because you can see there's lots of great areas here. This one in particular is really high functioning as are the activity areas, the cerebellum. It's just in the frontal lobes, just in the frontal lobes. So without some assistance compared to a kid who doesn't have that under metabolism, um, you're going to have problems in what that part of the brain does, which we already discussed, impulse control, organization of thought and action, etc. See it? It's a brain condition. It's a brain condition. It is not a behavior condition. It's not a behavior condition. Oh, I showed you too soon. It was going to be really dramatic, but I messed it up. Remember when I said cortisol is a real problem for the ADHD brain? Uh, when you really stress it out, it decompensates. What do I mean by that decompensation? So this is a moderate case of ADHD. It's not minor, but it's not extreme. It's kind of in the middle. It's moderate. So this same brain is then put under stress in the MRI, and this is what happens. Same brain, but now with a higher level of cortisol. So now this brain's going to be able to do a lot less than that brain. And typically, that stress comes from a demand in the environment that that brain do something. So when that demand is made in a way that heavily stresses that brain, things are not going to get better. Even though the intent of the demand or the way demand is delivered is intended to get compliance. Does that make sense? So when it's like, uncross your arms, I'm not telling you again. How many times have we talked about it? That's not going to help him. Okay, that's not going to help him because that's going to happen to his brain. All right, but saying, and your name is? Josh. Josh, again, uh, be very helpful if you uncross your arms. Okay, remember in the class, we should pretty much have a pen and, and maybe make some notes. And if you don't want to make some notes, draw some pictures. Okay, but keep them uncrossed, all right? And I might have to say that 10 times. All right? He's getting the feedback, but I'm not stressing him out. That's a huge difference because in my experience, most ADHD kids get what I call the heavy compliance approach because of the belief that it's all about their behavior, that they're purposely choosing behavior uh, that they can control and they're purposely deciding that they're not going to do that. Uh, and that's not what's going on. That's not what's going on. So you need the limits, you need the guidelines, but uh, please take with you today how you deliver those is critical because the part of the brain that causes cortisol to flow is called the amygdala and amygdalas talk like this and what it causes is when you talk like that it causes cortisol to flow you are a mature frontal lobe right frontal lobes are reasonable they're knowledgeable and they talk like this
They're firm, they're strong, but they're calm. They're cool as a cucumber and they're in control. Now, unrelated to just ADHD kids, all kids, right? The moment your kid's brain sees that they've made you out of control, that will cause stress in them, okay? Because they need you to be the one that can figure all this out. But if they do things and your voice rises and you're clearly out of control, the first thing their brain does is go, wow, look what I did to mom, cool. <laughs> That's a lot of power to give a kid. First of all, do you wanna give them that much power? But secondly, after they say cool for a while, if you don't calm down pretty quickly, then they're gonna get scared because they know they can't handle this. And if you can't handle it and you're losing your stuff, um, that's gonna cause lots of cortisol to flow. Okay, lots of cortisol to flow. Okay, now there's the same brain on Adderall. And while I'm not a physician and I don't like to make pronouncements about whether you should or should, not put your child on medication. I just want you to understand this part. The purpose of all ADHD medication is one, one. And that purpose is increase oxygenation, blood flow, glucose delivery to the brain, period. They all do the same thing. That's why the initial treatment many years ago was an amphetamine, a narcotic amphetamine known as Ritalin. So if my kid's hyperactive, why the heck would I give them an amphetamine? Because what one thing an amphetamine does is vastly increase blood flow, oxygen and glucose to the brain. So if your problem is you're not metabolizing oxygen and glucose well, then let's have some backups ready to go. So as soon as you metabolize, the next ones are there. We're increasing, right, trying to push metabolism. And when I say that's all, no medication gives any kid any behaviors. The medication does not give them behaviors. Okay? It's, tended to, it's trying to influence their behaviors by doing this. See what's happened? The holes have closed. Now they're not all the way closed because no medication cures that condition. But look at the difference, right? So it's that brain under stress, now on Adderall. So for 25 years, without change, the research has been enormously consistent with ADHD. The best treatments for most kids are a combination of medication and behavioral support. Okay. Medication and behavioral support. Why? Because the medication helps the brain get in a better place to be able to make memories of what you might say download, use the behavior supports that they're receiving. Finally, there's a real severe case. So see the difference? This is a moderate case. That's a very severe case. So this is gonna be significant issues with functioning on a daily basis, on a daily basis. And then um, there's that same brain with Adderall. And hopefully you see it makes the point, it depends where you start, how severe is your case, what the medication does. Because especially in schools, I hear, well, when Frank got the medication, he was just so much better, we could really work with him. But when Sue got the medication, eh, not so much. Well, that's because Sue was probably a much more severe case. So when she takes medication, she looks like Frank did before medication. <laughs> See it? It's all different. It depends on the severity um, uh, of the metabolism and the dopamine issue that your particular child has. So like any condition, it's not the same in everyone. Having ADHD means lots of different things depending on um, your brain, your particular brain, and one of those things is severity, severity. So Adderall, and then uh, last one, that's another really severe case, and then Ritalin, right? So it helps, but it doesn't resolve the metabolism issue, so you're still gonna have somewhat behavior consequences from that. Um, that we're going to look at. Question? Is it the delivery mechanism between the Adderall and the Ritalin that would, like, because the brain that you showed with the Adderall seemed a lot better than with, wait. Not yeah, not we right. started there. There's Adderall. Okay. And then that's a new brain. That's a brain number three. So a different, a different type and, and areas. See, this one's much larger, okay. not bilateral. This one's okay. smaller. 
makes a little bit of difference. And we almost closed that one completely, have a little bit left of that one. Yeah, but Ritalin's not used anymore and, and shouldn't be. Uh, Adderall, uh, Concerta, they're much, much better chemicals. One, they're not um, narcotic. <laughs> and two, you know, science continues to get better and better at uh, pinpointing and targeting this metabolism issue. All right, if you would, stand up for a minute. All right, so with your learning partner, I want you to summarize for them what I've just been talking about. Why is ADHD a brain condition? Why is it a brain condition? And kind of what's happening in there. Put it in your own words. This is not a test, but it's, but it's safe rehearsal, right? Because you're parents, which means you're advocates. And so you want to get comfortable talking about this with others who may be using that amygdala voice all the time with your children and explain to them why you'd like them to use a different voice, why you'd like them to use a different approach. Yes, you understand your, your child needs to be given boundaries and guidelines. That's perfectly fine with you. The way it's done, all right, does matter to you. Okay? So you want to be able to talk with them comfortably about why. Help each other. Leave no one twisting in the wind. You've got two and a half minutes. Go. All right, thank your learning partner for borrowing their brain. And um, so let you know, ladies and gentlemen, about 15 minutes, then we'll take a brief break. So if, if you're wondering if we're going to have one, yes, we'll have one. Uh, just so you can get out and stretch, use the restroom, et, uh, et cetera. About 15 minutes, um, and we'll come back for our second half. All right, so what is ADHD? Well, before we do that, uh, another little brain test, uh, one of my favorite. So uh, I wanted to see how your brain's doing this morning. Again, uh, not a typical place for all of us on Saturday morning, so I so want to know how it's doing. And particularly, I'm interested in its speed. How fast is your brain operating now? Is it warmed up? Is it at full RPM, so to speak, et cetera? So in this brain test, I want you to answer out loud and uh, as fast as you can uh, the questions I'm going to ask you on the next couple of slides, all right? Out loud, fast. Ready? Yes. Yes. Okay, not too bad, not too bad. Let's try it again. Are we ready? Yes. All right, here we go. What color is that envelope? White. White. What do cows drink? Milk. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you have seen this before and still said milk, right? Yes. So what's going on there? Well, as we get into what ADHD is, this, this uh, is, is so important. Because how do I get you to do that? How do I get a whole room of really smart people to answer a very simple question incorrectly? At least most of you. At least where I come from in Nebraska, cows drink water. When I was coming out to the East Coast about 20 years ago, I heard this rumor, you're much nicer to your cows, they get milk out here. Where's that come from? An association. I know that in your brain, your neurons have connected a white drink that comes from a cow is called milk probably millions of times. And so all I have to do is lead you down the primrose path, get you to think white cow drink and you're going to milk, even if it doesn't make logical sense. And I want you to appreciate the power of those associations because the association uh, of ADHD, what it is, what it means, can have a powerful impact uh, on your child because you can become your whole identity around your ADHD. That can become who you are. I'm a kid with ADHD instead of I'm a kid. And so uh, that association is one you, you want to be careful doesn't develop too strongly. In other words, that your, hot, your child's whole experience is colored solely by the fact that they have ADHD. Those associations become powerful uh, and very hard to change. Very hard to change. All right. What year was this story written in? You're going to guess that with your learning partner. Let me see if Philip can be a little gentle man. Let me see if he is able to sit still for once at table. He wriggled and giggled, and then, I declare, swung backward and forward and tilted his chair. So I think all of us could say, yeah, a certain type of ADHD presents like that, looks like that. Um, what year do you think this story was written? Make a guess. What year, by the language, etc., do you think this story was written? That was 1844. 
1844. Um, it appears human beings have had ADHD uh, as long back as we have enough information in the records to identify it. So uh, there's lots of history um, and lots of stories. And it is, with the researchers who like to delve into this, there's a number of people that they believe, very famous people, who have ADHD. I'm going to show you some real famous ones we know now, in fact, have been diagnosed with it. But in particular, I found interesting Abraham Lincoln is thought to have had ADHD of, of at least a moderate amount, if not a severe amount. Um, and so it surprises us maybe uh, some brains that, that have uh, ADHD. And the other thing I want you to see by this is the science is only going to continue to get better at identifying what it is because it's really struggled. You can see how many times it changes names, how many times it changes uh, what it thinks. Uh, about uh, what it is. Um, in the 1980s is where we first started to see the term attention deficit. Hyperkinetic reaction of childhood is what I was taught when I went to school. And before that, it was minimal brain dysfunction is what it was called. Um, and thank goodness they changed that name, right? It was actually trying to be nice in the sense of saying only a part of your brain is not functioning well, but it sounded like you had a minimal brain, didn't it? Uh, but it was only dysfunction they were talking about. Uh, then we got into uh, attention uh, deficit hyperactivity and then three subtypes. And uh, inattentive, hyperactive, impulsive, or combined. So uh, science will continue to develop. Uh, in other words, not everything that we can know about ADHD is known yet. Uh, and I think that's important to understand. We're now in the DSM-5, which came out in 2013. And they inserted the word predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive, impulsive, or combined. And so just change the language uh, a little bit. Uh, why? It's getting harder and harder to put kids in boxes and say that they're hyperactive uh, only uh, or that they're um, inattentive only. And combined is kind of like probably what they are most of the time. Um, but I just wanted you to see that there's a history here and that the science continues to, to evolve. And the, kind of the good news from this, before I leave it, the good news from this is no, particularly if you're a parent, that some of really the most brilliant people on the planet are, are working to help you. Uh, they study nothing but ADHD, and, and they're dedicated to finding better and better and better ways uh, to understand and then work with that brain. Uh, and, and they're working on behalf of all of us who uh, live with, love, care about, or have ADHD. Uh, and at times, that can be reassuring. Um, and I'll share some of those names with you as we, we get near the end with some of the resources and encourage you to look them up, follow them on Twitter, uh, see what's going on in that, that ADHD scientific world. It's pretty interesting. All right, so what is it? Genetic. Genetic. So it pretty well determined that uh, it's been a genetic pass down of ADHD. In fact, it would be very rare if you have a child with ADHD that no one else in either of mom or dad's family would have had ADHD. In other words, it doesn't mean it's directly from the parent, though some of you may have ADHD, but it's almost always from grandparent or great grandparent. It's highly unusual not to find within four generations someone that had ADHD. Now, they may have never been diagnosed with it. Um, and, uh, of course, the older they are, the more likely they weren't diagnosed with it, particularly if it was before 1968. But it's likely it's in the family, and you probably know who those people are or, or might be. And notice that science is real clear. This is brain-based. It's not behavioral-based. It's brain-based. This is not a misbehaving child. This is a child with a different brain. All right, there's executive function skills. And so uh, uh, I wanted you to see that, that this, this is a good site uh, to get information. But I wanted you to see mostly those things. But they get kind of lost in the paragraph, so I just broke them out there. So now we see a little broader with the executive function skills. Executive function skills happen in the frontal lobes. In the frontal lobes of ADHD children, they're a little bit smaller, and they don't metabolize as efficiently. So if you have ADHD, you're tend at times you're going to struggle with these things. Struggle with these things. It has nothing to do with your intelligence and it has nothing to do with parenting. Getting better at them can help with parenting, 
but parenting didn't cause these issues. Right? They're genetically passed down, this difference in how the brain functions, but they affect these things. And this, right, is where the behavior comes from. When we say it's a behavior problem, particularly, particularly in certain contexts, in certain contexts. So uh, predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive, combined. I only show you that, you probably heard these. If your kids have IEP, you've heard them over and over. Um, but just this is that DSM, what they have to say about your child to get reimbursed for the services they provide your child. In other words, be careful not to adopt this wholesale of my child is this, because just realize this is what has to happen for reimbursement to occur for services for your child or to get them an IEP to begin with. Um, but don't get locked into it. It's just a, a payment mechanism or a regulatory mechanism to get you an IEP. My favorite quote, ADHD is a constellation. So think of lots of different things, right? When you see a constellation, kind of the big picture, it affects the whole child. Of context dependent behaviors. Most disruptive where? In restricted environments. Restricted environments. But in the right environment. It is no more a disability than being blind in the dark or being dyslexic on the soccer field. Second train whistle of the day. <laughs> ADHD is only a problem in particular context. What context? Primarily school. Why? School is restrictive. Okay. What do you have to do in school to succeed? What are the requirements? There they are, right? See that? But on a soccer field, it's not as restrictive. As long as you stay in bounds <laughs> and don't break too many of the rules, uh, ADHD really isn't much of a factor on a soccer field. It's not as restrictive. But think about school. I mean, all day long, school is about rules and it's about concentration, and it's about focus, all the things you're not good at for six hours a day. So you might think of something that you really dislike doing or feel that you're not very successful at. And we're gonna put you in that context six hours a day. And then you're gonna come home, and some of your parents are gonna say, do more of that miserable, awful <laughs> stuff before you can do anything fun. Um, Trying to put yourself in that place, uh, I think, can be helpful uh, in terms of understanding uh, what's happening. It's the context. And the hard context for all ADHD brains is school. Because school requires you to use all of the skills in high level that you're struggling a little bit with. And the skills that you're really good at, that you'd like to do, you can't do that in school, in most of the classes. So not a lot of classes are, uh, you know, creativity, imagination, right? Lots of interaction, give and take, uh, lots of talking, activity, playing, playing games, etc. cetera. That's, that's typically not what school is about, particularly the older you get, right? And so the things your brain's good at doing, they say, no, you can't do that. And the things your brain really struggles with, you've got to do all day long. All day. It's the context that makes it challenging. Which is why when you look at, and if you've never done this, look up famous people with ADHD, which is why none of those people did well in school. But no matter how you measure success, I'm going to show you there's somebody with ADHD at the top of that list, no matter how you measure it. And it happened, what, after they left school. And there's no longer those huge restrictions and limitations on their behavior. So the bad news is, if your child has ADHD, school is probably in always going to be a challenge in, in ways. It can definitely get better, um, but it's probably always going to be a challenge. But the good news is if you can persevere, support, and help them through that, when they get out of school, they'll, they'll likely really blossom. They'll blossom. Our ADHD brains are entrepreneurs. They are people who discover new products, new solutions, create new things. There are artists, there are writers, there are scientists uh, even. It's, it's amazing what they do. Um, when they get out of that constriction and they have more control over their time. Okay, so uh, impulsiveness, hyperactivity, or inattention are, are the characteristics if we focus on strictly the negative. But the big piece, again, is it's a biological disorder. And I don't even like the term disorder. That's why you hear me use the word condition. 
It's just the way it is. It's just a different condition. But because we're so driven in, in the United States, we've just set up our structure about school and public school, and it works in a certain way, which is exactly <laughs> what you would build for a torture chamber for the ADHD brain. No offense to schools. Uh, they, they hardly can do, uh, a lot, uh, do it a lot differently, but it, it literally is that, a torture chamber for ADHD brains. It's really tough, really tough. So uh, I like to look at this because you'll see this kind of stuff all over, and I know you have. So uh, impulsivity, inattention, and hyperactivity. But if we just change those words a little bit, we begin to see that our, our child isn't their ADHD because you can balance these real easily. Okay. Balance these real easily. So instead of inattention, uh, I have the ability to pay attention to a lot of things, particularly when they're quickly changing. So I'm great at attention shifting. Attention shifting. And uh, that can be a real advantage in today's really high-tech, high, high fast-paced uh, world. It can be great if you're uh, a lacrosse goalie, right? Uh, shifting your attention uh, constantly uh, as long as you can also learn, right, to focus on the ball. But the, the ability to see the whole field, watch different people moving, anticipate uh, what their uh, movements are going to be, uh, it can be a real advantage. So remember when you see these things, you can just simply switch them and you've got a real positive. So the hyperactivity, uh, high energy, high energy, right? So I always remember, uh, and, and no politics or affiliation, it's just the example. I always remember Jeb Bush and in the Republican primary, what did he get called? He got called low energy, right? And our white cow drink uh, approach got associated with that. Oh, there's Jeb Bush, he's low energy. And low energy is just this negative thing, right? It's like it, it isn't good to have low energy. Um, and uh, if you say, uh, well, I want you to work with Frank, he's pretty low energy, but a nice guy. You're like, I don't want to work with Frank. I want to work with low energy people. But high energy people, yeah, give them to me, right? So in high, instead of hyperactive, just switching that language and saying high energy. See the difference? And, and it's really important because your child will be, it's an avalanche of negativity. Okay, from the labels to the words, they're all negatively focused. And what we can do is focus them uh, to be a little more balanced. I'm not talking about being unrealistic. I'm talking about being balanced uh, in how we say it. All right, so what are the symptoms if you're inattentive? Well, this is um, that close attention and sustaining it for a long period of time and follow through. Organization, that executive function uh, is a problem. And then, see what I mean? Avoids or dislike tasks required sustained mental effort. When I say school is a torture chamber, this is what I mean. Because all school is, is increasing levels of sustained attentional effort. The more you go up in grade, the more you've got to do this during the day. Right? Because in kindergarten, what are we going to do in kindergarten? We got to play, we got to dance, we got to do our little teapot, we got to sing. Right? And then as you go up the grades, what happens? I say we suck all the fun right out of it. Right? And it's more of this, that focused attention. And if the inattentive type, this is really uncomfortable. Really uncomfortable to do. Exhausting. All right. Uh, but if we're hyperactive, kind of the classic uh, often talked about, this is the high energy. Um, and, and what's going on here is I'm using my physical self and moving my physical self to give me that extra stimulation for my dopamine. See it? This is much easier to see how the dopamine is being sought and, and achieved, and it's through movement and activity. So if you make this connection, hopefully you see it. Exercise does what? Increases dopamine and serotonin. So lots of physical movement being, quote, hyperactive is going to increase dopamine and serotonin. Right? So for that brain, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's better than nicotine. It's better than alcohol. But what the kid continually hears is, you shouldn't be so hyperactive. You gotta sit down, calm down, all right? And I would only say, being a good person is not about the ability to sit down, all right? It's not a character trait. It's a context-dependent behavior. I understand teachers need kids to sit down so they can teach a class, but it's not character related. Um, and so it's the brain is what I'm, what I'm trying to emphasize. And just thinking, switching, pivoting our thinking uh, about it all being bad or somehow a malfunction or, or a detriment, uh, we go way overboard. 
and then kids develop this association and we'll see a few of those kids talk here after our break this association of they're just not as good a human being as people who don't have ADHD and that's the saddest part of ADHD by far I'm just not as good because all they hear is about what they can't do what they can't do but if you really look at it in perspective the only reason at seven years old to sit still is because of how we do school not that we do school how we do school which is you gotta sit still right and 100, 150 years ago when you were seven you did little sitting still at all and but we've you know right we're in this mindset that no a good kid a successful kid has to sit still it's kinda crazy you have to remember it's dependent on the context yeah Was it more so that they, they just weren't doing the research or the, the constraints in the child were just different so it didn't present as much? Now. Yeah, it, well, it's a great insight. It could be a combination of things. I, I think that, so it's in my family too, and I can uh, tell you my grandfather lived to 99, and until his last three months, he was all day long up and about and busy. And he was still driving. His favorite thing was to go to um, old junkyards and dig up scrap iron. And I mean, he's 99 years old and he's out doing this. Uh, he, he was totally hyperactive. And, uh, you know, we, we, everybody would say, God, I wish when I get old, I have as much energy as Frank. His name was Frank, too, uh, my grandfather. And so he's definitely had ADHD. Oh, my goodness. And to watch a television program, if he got 10 minutes into it, that was a lot. So you'd sit down and you'd watch it, sports or anything else. Ten minutes later, he was up and moving around. And we'd say, Grandpa can't sit still. Right? But he found activities that the context suited right, his brain uh, instead of like he could have never worked in an office. So what did he do? He worked on a railroad um, and uh, learned when he had to pay attention and uh, then uh, found the rest of the job enormously liberating and, and creating. So I think it's both. Uh, certainly till the late 1960s we weren't even calling it ADHD, just starting to, to look at the, the behaviors. Um, and also, I think people do what they have to do uh, to make things work. And they gravitate to jobs that allow that to happen. Great question. All right, almost a break here. Um, combined means you got both. You're both inattentive and sometimes have that, what appears to be hyperactivity or high energy. Uh, my view is most kids are this. It's really hard to say, and that's why they put in predominantly, that a kid is hyperactive or inattentive. Usually it's a combination. Those are the two things that, that they struggle with. And then back to executive function, I really like this. Why? And as we go to break, uh, I'll start passing these around so you can look at them. For the first time, you are the first generation, I'm the first generation, where teaching executive function skills explicitly to kids, there are curriculums now. And uh, these curriculums are perfect for parents. Why? They're short activities. Think of them as exercises that you use with your kids uh, at home. And you can share this with teachers at school that increase their executive function skills. Because the great thing about executive function skills, they're skills. And skills can be learned and they can be strengthened and improved. So it's called the Smart But Scattered series. The purple one is for uh, preschool through age five-year-old children. And then the green one is for uh, starting about fifth grade up through early college. And the cool thing about these books is you go to the back and um, you look up, uh, let's say, impulse control, right? And it tells you the page to go to and uh, impulse control, page 68. Uh, so you don't even have to read the whole book. Right Now, what's going to tell you what to look for in the index? Right here in front, you. You don't need a psychologist. You don't need a psychiatrist. You're going to do an executive function assessment uh, on your child. And uh, the assessment is, is really easy to do. There's some good brain pictures in here, too. Really easy to do. And it, that's all it is. It's, it's two pages. And depending on the age of your child, if your child's young enough, you'll do it you and any other uh, adult caretakers. If your child's old enough, say when they get into 14, 15 years old, you, you want them to do one and you do one and then match them up. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna give you a profile. 
no kid gets an A. In other words, even if you give this to kids without ADHD, you'll have strengths and you'll have areas to improve. And on the areas to improve, then you go back to the index and you find the exercises to help with that. Isn't that awesome? Absolutely awesome. So very, very practical, not time consuming. You don't have to read the whole book. You've got the assessment in it. I can't recommend these high enough. I've had so many people tell me how they've changed their lives. Last one, last comment. With this one in particular, because being a teenager, an adolescent brain is hard enough, right? And for us parents, it's really hard. Why? Because we don't know what's normal and what we should be worried about. So if you're a parent of an adolescent, I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. Is this normal adolescent behavior or should I be really worried about this? And this is really helpful with that. Why? Because we adultify our adolescents. What do I mean by that? More and more, we're attributing to a 15 or 16 year old that they should have adult behavior almost 100%. And the brain doesn't work like that. And figuring out what is reasonable uh, to ask of them uh, is enormously important and decreases everybody's cortisol and leads to really good development. Because sometimes I worry we're convinced that we gotta push, we gotta push, we gotta push, we gotta push more stuff down on younger ages if they're gonna have the edge, if they're gonna be successful. And in fact, it's just the opposite. Um, we know what kids need at each age to thrive and do really well. And to give a kid what he needs uh, at 22 at age 16 does not work. That doesn't make him a 22 year old. That makes them neurotic and anxious and depressed. And we have the highest rates of anxiety and depression in American adolescence that we've had since 1953. Because we keep doing this. We keep asking younger, younger, and younger to have older and older and older behaviors. And we really want to think carefully about that. But time to get you on a break. Uh, we will take 10 minutes. I'll see you back at 1040. At 1040. And then we'll spend the rest of our time on what the heck do I do with this? Uh, and what things can I do that kind of fit into my understanding that this is a brain condition um, of my child and not a uh, behavior condition. All right, enjoy your break. I'll see you in 10 minutes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, finish out uh, just that last session real quickly with possible causes uh, for ADHD. Uh, a single cause has yet to be identified, though it does look like uh, many, many uh, ADHD situations are genetic. They're a gene, uh, D2, uh, D2 something gene, I can't remember the rest of it. But the reduced size in frontal lobes and the uh, dopamine imbalance are what results in the behaviors that uh, can be problematic. Uh, head injury can contribute. Head injury can contribute to ADHD. So a blow to the frontal lobes um, can uh, be uh, significant. Frontal lobe symmetry is interesting. Um, in other words, as we grow and as we develop into adolescence and then adulthood, our two lobes, our two hemispheres, are not intended to be equal size, symmetric. In fact, your right hemisphere generally is a little bit larger, a little bit larger. In ADHD, there's symmetry. The right hemisphere doesn't get larger. And the best way I can explain to that to you real quickly is your right hemisphere is more conservative, risk averse. Your left hemisphere more uh, risk willing, put it like that. So um, out with my son Keenan a couple of years ago, we're in this hill that goes down our backyard. About this time of year, you know, spring's coming, uh, et cetera, trying to clear some stuff out. And here comes a garter snake, right? Just crawling through to maybe, maybe a foot and a half from us. Now, now, my son, who to my knowledge doesn't um, have ADHD, has probably a little larger right hemisphere, jumps back and says, snake, dad, look out. Me, I got frontal lobe symmetry. I'm like, I grabbed that thing, snake, cool, <laughs> right? And that's kind of the difference. So less risk averse uh, also. And so, you know, it might look to us like, um, hey, did you think about that before you did it? Or that's really dangerous, or are you crazy? What are you doing? Um, can, can be, they're just not as risk averse as you and I are. By the time you're through adulthood, for most of us, our, our right hemisphere is much larger, um, relatively speaking, and we're much more risk averse the older we get, uh, we tend to be. Okay, what ADHD is not? It's not a myth, right? Sometimes I hear in schools, sometimes 
well, is there really such a thing as ADHD and overdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, but, but it's a real thing, but it's not a disease. Um, and as we've looked at, it's not a, a problem of intelligence or skill, certainly not a re reflection of character or parenting. So one of the hard things I know about being an ADHD parent, a uh, parent of a child with ADHD, is, is a lot of times <laughs> people look at you like, you're the problem, you must have done something wrong. You must not be a very good parent. Uh, and you can feel it if they don't overtly say it. And um, that's unfortunately uh, what happened when ADHD got described as a behavioral disorder. Well, behavior is what? The responsibility of parents. So if your child's got behavior problems, that's on you, uh, which, is, which is unfortunate and, and often very difficult right in the, the school and parent relationships. Um, and uh, I think schools who really work hard at the relationship with parents um, understand that ADHD is not parent-based, uh, but sometimes um, that uh, idea still persists out there. All right, index card. You'll find them on the corner of your table. Grab one, please. All right, so on one side of your index card, in just a minute, when I say go, I want you to just make a list of things to answer this question. So based on everything we've talked about so far, and probably mostly your own experience, uh, which, which will play into this even more, what tasks, what tasks or behaviors, tasks or behaviors that are challenging, difficult to perform uh, by a child or youth uh, who has ADHD? What tasks, specific tasks, or behaviors are difficult to do. Yeah, it's like the fire alarm went off at school. All right. That was interesting. Oh, see. Like last night it was rocking and rolling, right? The thunderstorm, but. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay. Well, we might, we might be Nathan starting again with our projector. So the screen's up. All right, so we're going to continue through this. So tasks or behaviors that would be challenging or difficult. And you can think of this at home, at school, uh, out with friends, in the community. Uh, what might some of those be? Actually came in a good point, uh, what we're doing right now. I know many of you are still writing. Turn and share with your learning partner some of the things you came up with. Tasks or behaviors that might be difficult. All right, flip your card over. Flip your card over. Same question, except instead of difficult, uh, now you want to think about easy. So based on what we've discussed, your own experience, what tasks or behaviors are easy or might be easy for a child with or youth with ADHD to do? We've talked about difficult. Which ones are easy? Thank you, Nate.
And equally share with your partners, what are some of the easy ones on your list? All right, so that quick activity is a really important one though because our first kind of exercise or way of thinking about how we want to uh, work with ADHD, and I feel like you guys are probably better experts than I am at it because you lived with it, but you want to what I call layer difficult activities with easy activities. So uh, for example, continue to work on your list. Observe for things that are difficult and easy and then layer them. What would be a practical example? Your child comes home from school. Typically, it's gonna be very difficult if the first thing they do when they come home from school is homework. Layer it, put an activity in between that's easy or they enjoy, and they're usually one and the same, before they go back to the next layer, which is something that's gonna be difficult for them. And try and, and think of layering activities in between. Activities in between. And a way that you do that that's very effective is you get one of these. So I struggle with ADHD. I can look at my watch 100 times. I don't know what time it is, and I can't track the passage of time. But I can follow this thing. Why? It's a pie chart. So um, it's like I, I tell my kids it's like pizza. And so this is 59 minutes, for example. right? And when it's 45 minutes, now it looks like that. And my brain can track that. So I can look at this and the shape tells me about how much time I have. I make that association. So with layering, let's say um, I, I am gonna have to do my homework. We got a lot going on this evening and I've only got 20 minutes for the easy or the fun activity. You set this where the child can see this. You tell the child about this when the red's gone, homework time, okay? And you get there, you're right, you get their agreement. Not that they'll always do it, but you get their agreement and you work at it and then 20 minutes, they get to do their fun, easy, enjoyable thing, and then we go to the task that's difficult, but nonetheless has to be done. Here's the key. When you go to the difficult task, you do the same thing, okay? So having an ADHD child sit for an hour and a half, hour and 15, 90 minutes of homework will almost never work. It, it'll escalate, right, in, into a, a bad outcome. Try layering, so 10 minutes, Easy, 10 minutes homework. Or 20 minutes easy, 20 minutes homework. Uh, and that will typically work much, much better. They're not being excused from doing anything. The, the mindset that can get in the way here is you can't have any fun until all of your right, work is done. Work is done. How do you do with that? Right? How do you do with that? Most of us are enormously stressed because... <laughs> We work too much and we have no fun. And it's hard to say that we enjoy that. Now you might say, well, that's being responsible. I have to do it. Granted that, but they're kids. They've got to have a little bit of fun. Layering is very effective. Okay? And it starts by being aware of, observing what your child either likes doing or finds it easy to do. Things that are easy for us to do are restorative. I love that word. They restore our energy. And remember, when I have to focus in that context at school, it's draining the energy out of me. And so restorative activities might be another way to think about it. What do they do that restores their energy? Um, yes. Oh, it's called a time timer. So if you just put that in Google, I think it's timetimer.com. They come in three sizes. This is the smallest. They come in a medium size. And then like all our schools at my organization, we have the big clock size, uh, which I love. So uh, let's say meals. Your child has difficulty sitting through a family meal, right? And you want to have some conversation and some time together. You put one of these big ones 
in your dining room or where you eat and you said we're going to have dinner for 20 minutes or 22 minutes or however long you want it to be and so they can see that the time is moving it, it feels like three hours to them but it is in fact moving it can be very helpful yeah yeah we agree on that I love it I love it okay so uh, you know this let me say it fast learn as if you're a parent learn as much as you can learn as much as you can knowledge is truly power um, do not make this assumption. I love schools. We operate schools. I love teachers, and I think our schools have the best intentions. So please take what I say appropriately. Do not assume your school is an expert on ADHD. Do not make that assumption. You be the expert, right? You learn uh, about it. Many schools are, but just making the assumption they are is often a mistake. And sometimes we get into situations where people are telling us about what needs to happen with our child and they might not even be the best informed uh, on that issue or on that condition. How will you know if they're the best informed? Because you will have continued to learn um, and continue to grow in your own uh, knowledge of ADHD. Um, and then you gotta advocate. I mean a powerful advocate, a powerful advocate. An ADHD kid can be run over because all it is is negative and problems and difficulties and consequences and calls home and detentions and uh, you, you've got to advocate that if something is chronic and continues to happen, we've got to have a change, right? It's not working uh, uh, for my child and, and being willing to challenge that and say that. And then you're your child's surrogate frontal lobes. You already know this already, but isn't that kind of a cool little way to think about it? So their frontal lobes struggle at times, right? And so what do you do? You let them use yours. And uh, all parents do this for all children, but with ADHD, it just tends to be a little stronger, right? So Keenan, sit here, do this. You should be doing this right now. Are you ready to go here? Have you thought about in 15 minutes, we're gonna be doing this, are you ready? Uh, you know, is your soccer clothes in your bag? Is your bag by the door? Where are your shoes? <laughs> all of those are, right? Your frontal lobe telling their frontal lobe kind of what it should be thinking about, okay? And uh, you're, you're gonna do that the rest of your life. Um, which is cool, maintains the relationship uh, for, for a long period of time. So um, I mentioned several times about uh, great brains with, with ADHD, and uh, the second thing in, in a, after layering that I think is really important is make sure your child knows this, that there are really, really successful people. However you define it, and you choose how you define it, but I'll show you no matter how you define it, there are really, really successful people who have ADHD. Because again, it can be overwhelming uh, when you have it that, that you lose hope that um, you're gonna be a, as successful as others can be. And so I love Salvador Dali, um, you know, a, a amazing painter. And this one is uh, the melting clock, um, cl melting clocks actually. Uh, this is Ansel Adams, often considered one of the greatest photographers ever. Both had severe ADHD. Um, Jennifer Addiston, um, Albert Einstein, Derek Jeter, Bill Gates, all ADHD. Uh, I think the greatest athlete currently on the planet is Simone Biles, severe ADHD. Justin Timberlake um, in the entrepreneur world, uh, Richard Branson. Um, so whether it's athletics, whether it's money, whether it's entertainment, whether it's intellect and, and uh, science, uh, you're gonna find somebody with ADHD that's enormously successful. And um, our kids don't hear those stories very often, if at all. And so we want to make sure that we're sharing that. Um, and with Google, it's so easy. So you just Google uh, uh, successful people with ADHD, famous people with ADHD, notable people with ADHD, and you'll find the thing that your child's interested in or cares about. And uh, they need to see role models. They need to see people like them that have had success. And it's enormously motivating. And, and for some of them, will be really motivating because it might be the first time that they understand that people with ADHD do reach the highest levels of success uh, everywhere. All right, so another index card. So put the name of your child on the top of the card.
And if you have multiple children that you're thinking about, you might have to make columns or use the back, uh, et cetera. But what I want you to do is simply list strengths and things you love about them, about their personality, about their temperament. You will not share this with your partner, just so you know. Actually, I'm going to ask you to do something very different with it, but it is private to you. It is private to you. won't ask you to show it, share it to anyone. But I just want you to think carefully. What are the strengths in your child? And another way to think about that is what, do you, what are the things you really love about your child? Because obviously those are strengths because you love them for it. As specific as you can be, concrete as you can be. All right, three instructions for this. Instruction number one, for the rest of the workshop, just keep this out and as you think of things and things come to mind that are another strength of your child or something you love about them, just, just write it down in there uh, so you remember that. Number two, pocket or purse. Pocket or purse. So when you leave, this is for you, not for them. This is for you in your pocket or purse. And then number three is when you get home, put it somewhere where you will see it, not necessarily them. They don't need to see it, but you'll see it. Some of you will like to put it in a place where you see it every morning. Others of you will like it to be in a place where you see it every night. What's it for? It's to remind you objectively and overtly about those things that are strengths and, and the things that you love about them uh, because it helps balance our stress and anxiety uh, about our children and also is fair to them in terms of uh, keeping us from getting overbalanced on the things that are problematic. Uh, finally, uh, for some of you that are comfortable with it, it may motivate you to remember to tell the child that. Um, for some of your children, they don't know that, that maybe you love this about them or you think this is a real strength in them. Um, and it is powerful and very effective. About every, it, it's different for, for different people, but about every month, redo your card. Redo your card. Um, so that you're updating it, you're seeing what stays the same, what you might have added, what's different, okay? What's different, All right? Okay, why? And you say, Frank, really? Really? Yes, really, why? First, mirror neurons. Another thing that happens up here, um, and it's really, really powerful, even if you have ADHD, is what are called mirror neurons. And mirror neurons do exactly what they sound like. They mirror what we see in the environment and uh, we do two things uh, with our mirror neurons. One is we learn. And many believe, and I agree, it's our primary way of learning. That we've only read in mass um, for less than a thousand years as human beings. And prior to that, how we learned was through our mirror neurons. We talked and we watched. And if we could watch it being done, uh, we could copy it. And so uh, mirror neurons make a big deal in learning. But even more important, they allow us to be empathic and read other people. They allow us to feel the feelings of others. So mere neurons mean I can figure out by your facial expression, by your tone of voice, by your body language, probably how you feel about me right now. What's the point? When you're stressed, they're stressed, period. Right? And your child doesn't need to have ADHD, you know, for this to happen, right? When you're stressed, they're stressed because they have mere neurons. They have mere neurons and they're on all the time in childhood. Why? What's the point of childhood? You've got to survive. That's the whole job of the child brain. Survive. How do you survive? You better figure out the adults and how they're feeling about you at any given minute. Because survival includes not just physical survival, but emotional and social survival. And so by looking at this card, it reminds you, oh yeah, my kid's got mere neurons, and if I'm not once in a while telling them that they have strengths, that they're lovable, that this is why I care about them, I mean, who else is gonna do that, right? And it's also gonna mean you present to them something other than stressed out, disappointed in them, frustrated with them, critical of them, etc. Okay, it's gotta be a balance, and this can, can help you balance. Why? Because you remember this, right? Um, if all a kid gets is their cortisol and adrenaline driven up all the time by how adults deal with them all day, then their serotonin and dopamine are on the ground. Life's miserable. There's got to be a balance. It's got to be a balance. 
Okay? If you're going to do the best possible. Go ahead. When does the, the cortisol, I mean, shift from ADHD to anxiety? Because if you're always up here, you know, you, your anxiety is going to be up here. So you have a kid struggling with all of its normal ADHD issues, plus you have the anxiety issues on top. Is that just like the complicated mess? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I would say this way. It's, it's typically how others behave toward the child's ADHD um, manifestation that determines cortisol level. If that makes sense. It's kind of one of the points I, I've really been trying to emphasize is um, if you do things like balance out, so my whole day isn't about what I did wrong, what you're disappointed in, what I got to do next, this consequence, um, you balance me out a little bit. What I, what I fear is adults in, in schools and, and in homes are so worried that their child is not going to be able to function and succeed. And, and there's this deep set belief in American culture that you change children's behavior solely by consequences. Um, that we get, we get this way out of whack. We're just driving that kid down, down, down. There's no dopamine or serotonin. Um, and they're children and there's no fun or enjoyment or connection in life. And I'm just trying to emphasize that the cortisol, you're right, is gonna be high enough because you have ADHD, but adding to it with um, a misunderstanding of what changes behavior. Um, your, your ADHD kids have seen every consequence on the block, right? I, I've, I've had ADHD kids tell me, bring me your lunch detention. Like, come on, are you kidding? I, I've had all of these things. <laughs> They're not motivating. Um, what you'll find is switching, and, and we'll see it in a minute, switching where the rewards if you do X, you get A, instead of if you don't do X, you lose A, uh, is huge because they want dopamine just as much as you do. Okay. Thanks for the question. All right. Uh, I'm not going to go over this. This is uh, just screening uh, for ADHD, but if you needed a screening, you probably wouldn't be here. Um, all right. So some more key strategies. Big one. Many of you probably do this. If you do it, do it more. Modify your environment to play into ADHD strengths. What's an ADHD strength? Vision. Vision is a powerful ADHD strength. If I can see it, I can work with it and manage it. But if I can't see it, it's challenging. So very long story here. I'll try and make it real short. Working with a family and uh, the issue was morning routine um, and, and their child, incredible kid, but had ADHD, morning routine was a mess. Long story short, because it's a lot longer story, but we literally um, just sat with the child during their morning routine, you know, in the different rooms in the house, child's bedroom was upstairs. And what we saw was the child spent an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out which drawer their clothes were in. Why? They had a typical dresser. All the clothes are in the drawer, which means the child can't see them unless what? They pull out every single drawer. And that's what was happening every morning. They couldn't remember which drawer, which clothing element is, or when they put their clothes away, which their parent insisted they do, they didn't put them, all the socks in one drawer. You know, they spread them out. So long story short, what did we do? We took the toy carol that looks like this and we made it the dresser. Now the child can see where their pants are, where their socks are, where their shoes are. It's in an organized fashion. And the toys, which were often the distraction, went behind the drawers where they couldn't see them, where they would have to go and look and take some extra time. Enormously effective. So think about how can I make it visual and provide visual aids uh, for regular routines that that child has? Uh, a photo on each drawer would definitely work. Definitely work. Yeah, lots of different ways to do it. G good insight. Yeah, it doesn't have to be this. Just an example. Uh, and there are a couple of more. I like the idea of putting the toys behind it. <laughs> yeah. So things that are distracting, you make it harder to get. All right, and it's true with any habit and any child, but with ADHD can be enormously, which is what? If you want to decrease the use of a habit or behavior, make it harder to do. Don't 
focus solely on punishing it if it's done, but make it harder to do. So if you want your child to decrease screen time on a computer, the first thing I always ask is, where is it? And put it in a place that's more difficult to get to. So if the child's seldom in the basement, put the computer in the basement. So in other words, they got to go from the third story down to the first story to use the computer. Or put it where there's almost always an adult present so that the adult can always see if the child's tried to use the computer if you're trying to limit the time. When you want to increase a behavior, make it easy. Make it easy. Put the stuff everywhere. So if you want to uh, build your child's willingness to be expressive and do arts, have your art supplies in numerous rooms and mix them up and have them be different. You've got some drawing pencils and some sketchbooks in this room, but you've got uh, you know, maybe Play-Doh in this room. So if, if you think of it that way, um, it can be very helpful. How do I make this behavior easier because I want more of it? How do I make this behavior decline? I want less of it, make it more difficult either to access or to do. Uh, so visual cues and then movement, 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 movement because they need that dopamine. They're going to get it somewhere just like you're going to get your dopamine. So movement really helps give you dopamine. So my favorite thing, I have one. I love this thing. It's called a standing desk. See his leg there? It's on a bar. And all day long, uh, well, all day long, that's exaggerating, but probably a good half of my work day, I'm like this. And I am just pounding that thing. It makes no noise whatsoever, whatsoever. And it focuses me, and uh, I get that feedback, right, from the movement, and I get tired, I switch legs, um, I can pay attention, I don't distract anyone, even if they're in the same Rubens beat. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So um, you see the other things that are used, which are different types of seating that are flexible and provide different levels of feedback to the backs of the thighs. So physical stimulation, our physical therapist here, physical stimulation is enormously effective in helping a brain that's going really fast regulate itself, regulate itself. Now to you and I, if, if uh, you don't have that type of brain, um, that can be overwhelming. It could distract us. But to a brain that's really rolling a thousand miles an hour, it's actually very calming, very calming. So these different types of seats have different types of uh, stimulus. Some of them are nubbed. So all you do is you're just rolling real gently. You're not bothering anybody, but you're shifting your balance and those nubs are rubbing the, the uh, sciatic nerve. And they're very comforting and they give you enough stimulation to help you focus. Because to stay focused for a long time, I gotta be doing something. And as weird as that sounds, that's exactly how it works. And so uh, when we first at our school started giving uh, teachers and say, use these fiddle diddles, sponge balls, you see them call them stress balls, uh, what used to be like a Gumby-like figure, you know, you'd bend. They'd say, that's crazy. He needs to pay more attention, not less. He said, he will. He will if you give him this because that stimulus feeds the dopamine cycle, right? That extra feedback from the environment, which helps me focus more. Helps me focus more. So the seating can, can help a great deal. Um, quiet spaces because my issue is not paying attention. It really isn't. My issue is I pay attention to too many things. Everything is interesting, right? Everything's interesting. And so if you want me to pay attention to one thing, take as many of the others out of the environment as you can. And particularly true during homework time or any other type of focus time you're trying to do at home, what are the distractions? And I mean a typical standard clock that ticks, uh, I can't function. And I'm 58 years old and I can't function because it's too loud, <laughs> right? So um, trying to figure out and look at what are those distractions in the environment when you need that concentration and focus um, most is to try and, and create that. And then can they move, can they move, can they move, can they move? And for parents, I say particularly your homework space, particularly your homework space because for most ADHD families, that's like near the top of the list in terms of struggles is, is homework. Um, we just got to do it a little differently. One way is look objectively at the distractions. Don't rely on asking your child what distracts you. You look at it objectively and think of the, minors, the, the most minor thing that would distract you. Can you remove it from that environment, at least during the time the child's doing the homework? So what's hard here is you're busy. 
So many of you are cooking dinner while your child's at the dining room table because you want to watch them doing homework because if you don't watch them doing homework, right, it's not going to get done. But all of those cooking things are enormously distracting. The noise, the movement, the smells, the, the whole thing's distracting because what? It's all about we're going to eat dinner. And all of you know this. If there was some nice lunch coming in here now that had a smell, I don't care how interesting I am, your brain's going to go, it's a lunch, what is it? Is it going to be any good for you? And, and there's our two, right? So, so thinking about that homework structure. All right, other modifications. There are weighted blankets, weighted belts. There are weighted lap, um, things they put on their lap. What are these things? By providing stimulation to the large muscle groups in a like uh, weighted vest. We don't really use the blankets anymore. Um, that's in crisis, but like with a vest, it gives you weight which um, causes stimulation to your large muscles in your chest, right? In your chest and a little bit in your abdomen, but particularly in the back, in your back. And then a weighted lap is during that homework time, a weighted uh, lap pad is, weighs about, mm, you get them different weights, 5, 10, 15 uh, pounds, and the child sits it on their lap and it gives them, again, stimulation in that large thigh muscle group that can really help extend uh, their attention. Right? Extend their attention and focus because they're getting the stimulation through muscle stimulation, not through brain stimulation, because you want their brain stimulation to be on what they need to concentrate on. Okay. Helpful. And uh, those are all really good. So uh, occupational therapy aids, um, uh, fiddle diddles, uh, reading on the beach is, is for schools. I won't, I won't go into that. I do want to talk about uh, Two Desk Joe. So um, had a conversation during break about this. We've done all kinds of things to help kids um, who really are physically very active and have a hard time sitting in class to have teachers willing to experiment with some accommodations. And one of the most successful was we called it Two Desk Joe because the young man we work with was named Joe. And so what happened was the, the uh, you see closest to the teacher question mark. I personally have seen that seldom work. So the idea is if you have ADHD, you should be sat right next to the teacher so the teacher can watch you and continually give you feedback. And your name is? Pooja. Hi, Pooja. How do you do? Pooja, would you like me to stand here the rest of the workshop and watch you and continually give you feedback? No, I didn't think so, right? It's like we just got to think about that a little bit because it, I think it's very labeling and it says you're not like other kids. You need me to stand and watch you, right? And, and give you feedback, and the feedback typically is going to be when, when she's off task, when she's not listening, right, et cetera. So instead what we did is we allowed that Joe, that student, to have two desks. One was the corner you're in, very back corner, and then the other was right here by the teacher. And Joe was allowed to be in the seat he wanted. He got to pick that seat, and he could stay in that seat until he crossed the threshold of being disruptive. And it was very clear what that was. He knew exactly what that was. It was written and it was taped on the top of his desk. When that threshold was crossed, Joe had to move up to this desk until he was consistently, well, all right, not being disruptive again. Then he could go back. Do then he could go back. That? Did he do that on his own or not in the beginning. No, the teacher did it. Yeah, because in the beginning it wouldn't take long, five, ten minutes, and he was already over the threshold. Right, because it's a new environment and you don't self-regulate well in a new environment, right? He wants to do everything. But slowly but surely, the teacher was using her, right, frontal lobe voice. Not like, Joe, get up here. <laughs> you know, you didn't do it. But okay, Joe, come on back up. And she would say specifically what Joe did to cross the threshold, she called it. You she liked to self-regulate that. Liked yeah, it took a while, but then he self-regulated. And then by the second half of the year, I think she said the last six weeks, of the semester, uh, he barely moved at all. He was mostly in the back. But it takes a teacher being willing, you know, right, to do that. Yeah, standing desks in the back. Um, and then one child had a desk and a podium, but they were in the back, they were right next to each other. So same position, your name, ma'am? Hi, Lori. Same position that Lori's in, except uh, instead of, your name, sir? Bert. Bert. So Lori and Bert, Lori would stay there, but instead of Bert, we would put a, a like, podium there. And whenever Lori wanted to, she'd just stand up and stand on the podium and take her notes and pay attention. She's in the back of the room. She's not blocking anybody, but she could self-regulate standing up and sitting down. Uh, and for other students, that helped a great deal. Just that little bit of movement. Uh, but the sitting for long periods of time is hard. You've been doing it for uh, almost two and a half hours. You get an idea that that's really hard. Many of us adults don't sit for 
hours and hours and hours and hours a day. And, and if we do, we wish we didn't have to, uh, right? And so same thing with our kids. That little bit of movement makes, uh, makes a big deal. Here's another example of um, visual, visual, visual when you provide directions. And this is one I was really bad at. So I learned this the hard way by um, having my own challenges uh, as a parent. Uh, and what's that? Oral recipe. In other words, I would give my two children directives by mouth, orally, and they would be two, three, four directions at a time. Doesn't work well. So uh, this is one child. This is not one of my children. You'll see one of mine in a minute. Uh, but this is another child we work with, similar situation. He would come downstairs. Um, uh, he, he was a whirling dervish in the morning, very high energy kid. And he would say, okay, mom, my room's clean. Can I have breakfast now and, and get going? You know, and she'd say, uh, your room's clean? That seemed real fast. Is your bed made? Oh yeah, my bed's made. And she would go up there and they just didn't see eye to eye on what <laughs> right, having your bed made mean. So what worked, it, it wasn't this fast, but after figuring this out, what worked is just taking this photo series and it went on the back of his, uh, his door to his room. So before he went out the door to go downstairs, he could check himself. Right? Did I do it in these steps? Or most importantly, does it look made to mom's standards? The pictures were to mom's standards. But the photos were done with fun. It was fun. They had a good time doing them. You can see he's doing his big movements, you know, to model, and he had a lot of had a lot of fun with it. Josh is his name. Great kid. So those oral recipes, really pay attention to those because they almost always cause you problems. Always cause you problems. Because remembering a lot of things given, it, given to us orally is hard for almost all of us. In ADHD, it's particularly hard because your frontal lobes are involved in processing and uh, in, in the memory process. It's not solely your frontal lobes that do memory, lots in your hippocampus and other places, but you've got to hold it in short-term and working memory um, which is hard, which are executive function skills. So real quickly, uh, let's, let's do a little exercise with that because uh, short-term memory and working memory can get confused. Short-term memory and working memory are both executive function skills. So they do happen in the frontal lobes. Long-term memory, which you and I call learning, involves a lot of other organs in the brain. But short-term memory, working memory, uh, are frontal lobe skills. Oral directions require high high levels of working memory. And so that's why they don't work very often. All right. Now, let's start with short-term memory. Put your writing instrument down if you have one. I'm going to give you three letters, and I want you to just hold those three letters in your brain for 15 seconds, which is the typical length of short-term memory. All right. If you don't repeat it, you don't write it down, make a note, talk about it, it's usually gone after about 15 seconds. All right. So I want to give you a sense of that. And then after 15 seconds, I'll after you, ask you to repeat those words back. Here they are, uh, letters. I'm trying to go too fast myself now. Letters, three of them. T, P, A. T, P, and A. Time, give them back to me. Very good. T, P, N, A. Did 15 seconds seem long to you? Yeah. yeah. When you hear it, it's like, oh, that's no time at all. But when you experience it, it's like, okay. So generally in, in ADHD, you're looking at a short-term memory framework of more around 7 to 10 seconds. 7 to 10 seconds before the information is gone. But that's not as important with instructions as working memory. Here's working memory. Same instructions. Can't write this down. You can't say it out loud. You got to do it all in your head. Same three letters, T-P-A, but this time I want you to spell with those three letters as many words as you can in the English language, and you have to use all three letters and you can't add any letters. So how many English words can you spell with T-P-A, adding no letters and using all three in every word? You have 15 seconds. And time. How many we got? Three. 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 Very good. Very good. Tap, pat, and apt. A-P-T. Competent. Here's my point. It's not whether you got all three or not, but I wanted you to experience the difference. What's the difference? 
In short-term memory, all you have to do is remember the letters. But in working memory, you've got to manipulate them, right? Manipulate them how? According to a set of rules. According to a set of rules. All academic learning must use working memory. And the rules are what? Math formulas, scientific processes, the Krebs cycle in biology, I mean, you name it. It all requires working memory. You have to hold information in your brain and then you've got to play with it, manipulate it, work with it, which is why it's called working memory, in order to understand the concept or learn the skill. And this is why so many of our ADHD children struggle with learning because that working memory capacity is a frontal lobe skill and it's typically just a little bit behind. Not a lot behind oftentimes, but just a little bit behind. Uh, it's particularly noticeable in oral directions because it requires the same thing. Okay? Dad told me to go up and make my bed. Well, making my bed is actually 12 or 13 steps. So I got to remember each step in my head, not skip them, do them in the right order. Um, and in my case, I always wanted to do it quickly. Right? Now, if he tells me the 12 steps, I'm done after two, right? I'm done after step two. So this is why making it visual is so powerful and really works well. Okay, more than a single direction given by uh, voice alone. Sequencing cues are a big help. That's my daughter, Mackenzie. That's 14 years old. She's 27, employed. Let me say it again, 27, employed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So what was the problem? Darn kid couldn't do her dishwasher chore. Couldn't do it. So it was the only time my wife and I were both, you know, working at the time like many of you, and it was the only time during the day we got to sit and talk. Right after dinner, Keenan, my son, goes and puts, you know, clears the table, puts the dishes on the counter. Mackenzie's job, do the dishwasher. How hard could it be, right? You do this, you do this, you do this. I was given an oral recipe, right? And one of two things always happened. She would come out into the dining room and say, what was I supposed to do again after this and interrupt us, make us crazy, or say, okay, mom and dad, I'm done, I'm going upstairs to do the stuff that was what? Fun, that she enjoyed doing, and then we'd look in the dining room and it wouldn't be done. And so it was a negative loop. Call her back down, ask her to not interrupt us, etc. I just didn't see what the problem was, but it was a very negative loop. Um, it wasn't getting any better and our relationship was getting worse because I what? I made that fatal assumption that she was choosing to mess it up and not do it well and not pay attention and not be responsible and uh, not learning at that point, it was my oral recipe that was the problem. So what did we do? Well, I got the idea <clears throat> from a guy named George McCloskey, who I think is the best ADHD scientist on the planet. Uh, he's up in Philadelphia. And uh, so he was asking for examples in a workshop like this geez, a decade ago. And I told him about the negative loop and I just didn't know what to do. And he said, what have you tried? I said, well, I've tried telling her more slowly or trying to took more, I didn't know it then, but what I've told you, put more amygdala in my voice, right? And he said, how's that working for you, Frank? He said, no, it's not working. He said, try this. And uh, I'll pass it around. But I asked her to, um, he said, make it visual. And we really had a lot of fun. I asked her to uh, model for me. Uh, and, and she said, can I dress up? And I said, yep. Oops. <clears throat> Thought I had pictures of it, but they're here wear anything I want so when it comes around you'll see she's got her little skirt on or a little scarf on and what do we do we take a picture very simple words of each step in the dishwasher process and the two she forgot and then then we had fun we finished with a positive picture it went in this little album and this went on top of the refrigerator not there to embarrass shame you don't want anybody else to know about it put it in a, a place where she could grab it easily and she put it on the stove several times those are the real burns <laughs> And then when I asked her um, if I could use it in my workshops, uh, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. And uh, when she hit 21, she said I could use it. So I'll pass it around. These are so remarkably effective. I can't encourage you enough. I've seen teachers do them with uh, routines in school. Um, take the pictures, put them on a half sheet of construction paper, laminate them because they're teachers, right? You laminate it. And you punch a hole in the left-hand corner and you put them on a key ring. And you hang them in the room. So a child comes in, has to remember what their morning routine is or what, they, what goes in their cubby, what goes in their desk. They just go to the key ring. There they are. Doesn't have to interrupt the teacher. Um, and lots of these routines can be made visual. The visual sense is enormously powerful in ADHD children. Enormously powerful. Use it to your advantage. Sir? Eventually, did she stop using it? Yes. Did she learn the chore? Yes. 
Yeah, I forgot to say that. Uh, <clears throat> she would say it, it, it only took her about six weeks. I would say it was more like 11. I think, I think it was there at times as um, uh, kind of a safety piece, but I would see her peeking at it. Um, but yeah, at, at first she used it almost every time. Sometimes she used it in the beginning to remind herself. Most of the time she used it at the end to check herself. Um, but eventually we, we didn't need it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I, and I certainly understand that, uh, it, it, as you do too. You know, at that age where you want to fit in, not stand out. Um, so, a couple of things. Remember that that will eventually change. So he'll go back to wanting to stand out. Eventually, it's just just a matter of time. But I think you're doing exactly the right thing. I love the idea about the weighted vest, and instead you replace the hoodie, something that's a little closer. So, on the visual pieces, is there something that's more inconspicuous that um, he could feel? So if he needs the visual thing, it's like, uh, you know, you put them on, you put the visuals on little pieces of construction paper, you tape them together so they fold together, and they're about that big, and it goes in his pocket. So he knows they're there, that he can take them out and use them if he needs to, um, but they're not on his desk where everybody else could see them. So I think you're on the right track, just thinking about, okay, if, if he's essentially self-conscious about these things, how can I make them a little more inconspicuous? And then the second... Uh, advice I'd give on that is, is to tell him, like, dude, your brain, just so you know, it's like a superhero with vision. You got supervision. And the reason that mom is using these things and your teachers use these things is because your vision strength is better than the vast majority of people out there. So think about that because when you see it, you get it. Uh, and that's all I'm trying to do. So you might think about how that in talking to your son, you might say to him, you might think about how you might use that even more to your advantage. You know, I understand that you don't want to look different, but at the same time, you are different, but you're different because you're more powerful this way. And sometimes we want to hide our power. Sometimes we want to show it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to skip this one uh, and the card shuffle just because of our time. Well, let's do the card shuffle. Now, typically I would do it where I'd have you both fill out cards and then exchange them. But in this case, one of you will fill out cards and give it to the other. So if you're the person without cards, all right, don't watch what they're writing. That would be cheating. <laughs> typically you don't do that because you're writing your own cards. All right, so don't watch what they're writing. What are you going to write on the cards? First of all, do not number the cards. That's really important. Do not number them. But I want you to think about uh, a process, uh, well, teachers I do entering class or using your class, but for you guys, a common household chore. Common household chore. Let's say doing a load of white laundry, making a peanut butter sandwich, um, just something that your child would typically do in, in your house that requires a number of steps, right? And you're going to write one step of that process on each card. You're not going to number it, but you're going to write one step on each card. If I'm making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, get the bread from the pantry. Right? Get the peanut butter from wherever it is. Take the jelly from the refrigerator. Get out the butter knife. See what I mean? One step per card. One step per card. So don't choose one that's so complicated you don't have enough cards. Or you might have to combine steps on a card. Don't number them. And then when you're done, uh, I'll, I'll have everybody shuffle. So what's going to happen is when you're done, you're going to shuffle them and hand them to your partner who has no cards. And your partner, as fast as they possibly can, is going to attempt to put them in the right order. As fast as they can. It's going to be a speed test, so wait, because it's a competition. I'm going to see who finishes first. Yeah. All right? Any questions? OK. All right, if you haven't finished up, write your last one. And then shuffle, 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 shuffle them up good. You want to make absolutely certain they're not in the right order. Shuffle them up good, turn them upside down. And when I say go, hand them to your partner. When you get them, you want to put them in order as fast as you can. And 
When you think you have them in order, ask the partner who wrote them to check them. If your partner says, yes, they're all in order, raise your hand. Raise your hand, you will be our winner. On your mark, get set, go. Whoa, that was fat, another fast. Gotcha. Woo, good job. Got it. Excellent. <laughs> Got it. Good. I'm only going to move on because of because of time. Um, so you, you can keep working if you're still working on sequencing. Here's what I love about this activity. One is, because of working memory, sequencing can be challenging, right, for kids. This is a fun way to do it. So you can do it with words, or you can do it with pictures, um, but notice how engaging it is. When you're waiting to get those cards, and when you get them, like, you are what? Focused. There's a fun element in it, and when you're both doing it, uh, it, it's even better, but I didn't have enough cards, unfortunately. So you get focus. It's a fun uh, uh, kind of approach to it, uh, and you make it like a game or a competition for speed. And then the other piece that happens is when your child feels they're done and you go over it and things might not be out of sequence, it gives you some really good insight about what parts weren't in order. In other words, what mistake might they be making in the sequencing process? So words, pictures, um, all work, um, doing them like we did them spontaneously uh, is also a lot of fun. And it doesn't have to be about a household chore. That's what I, what I just picked. It could be about their favorite movie or their favorite book. Uh, in what order do things happen? Uh, it could be about something coming up for them that's important in terms of their performance or completion. What steps do you have to do uh, to make sure that that happens? But it's a fun way to do it. Okay, uh, focus on success. So here, um, I'm glad we're going to get to this before we finish. So you can see, six-hour version, right? I could go on all afternoon. But this one I'm really glad we, we got to because I think praise and praising your child is misunderstood uh, a lot in, in a couple of ways. One is praise does not build self-esteem. Praise does not build self-esteem. That's a big misconception. The purpose of praise, never forget it, the purpose of praise Get the child to repeat the behavior being praised. Say it again. The purpose of praise is to get the child to repeat the behavior being praised. Why? That's how habits form, is through repetition. It's the only way habits form. You've got to get repetition into the things you want. Now, why am I making such a big deal out of that? Because we waste energy and time and opportunity when we say, great job on that homework, Frank. Wonderful work, mowing the lawn and bringing in that mail or whatever it is. Those are wasted opportunities. Why? What was wonderful about it? What was great about it, etc. You want to do it so you have the highest possible opportunity that that young person knows how to repeat exactly that behavior. Okay, exactly that behavior. And so vague descriptions of nice or great or awesome, etc., help with relationship, but they don't build self-esteem. One thing builds self-esteem. It's called mastery, the ability to do something you couldn't do before. It happens in you. It happens in me. It happens in them. That's how you get self-esteem. And when you praise something that isn't a skill and don't give feedback on how to do it better, it's called false praise. Not only do, does my self-esteem not increase, I become suspicious. You're just telling me this because you're my mom or you're my dad or you're my teacher and you're supposed to. So make your praise concrete. Concrete. All right. So this is Carol Dweck. How many of you have heard of her work, Mindset? Anybody? Hey, uh, very common schools know this. Great book to get.
It's, it's probably one of the better ones out there uh, that's very practical on motivation. Another area in the brain that's enormously misunderstood. But motivation. So here's what Dweck says. Don't tell your kids they're smart. Don't tell them they're not smart. Stop using those words. Don't use smart. Don't use talented. Don't uh, use intelligent. Don't use not smart, not talented, not intelligent. Those words are very, very problematic. And so one of the things I hope is when you leave today, you never tell your kid again they're smart or not smart. You never tell your, again, your kid again they're intelligent or not intelligent. Don't tell them again they're talented or not talented. And if you think I'm crazy, this is a great one to finish with today. Because it's true. Watch. And again, practice it with my own children and so I know how true it is um, in experience too. So she said, look, she spent 30 years doing this at Columbia University, studying resilience. How come some kids can come back from lots of adversity and be real strong and real resilient, while other kids get the slightest adversities and they crumble? Dweck couldn't figure that out, so she spent three decades researching it. And her conclusion was, which is in her book mindset, but her conclusion was, it's what us adults say to them about their abilities that determines their associations, their white cow drink, about their own capacity, particularly their capacity to learn and change. So she says, look, when you tell them they're smart, they're talented, or they're intelligent, your intention is good. She's not wanting you to feel guilty or anything. She knows our intention is good. But she said the outcome is not what you intend. Why? Because the association that gets built is that talent or intelligence or being smart is a fixed trait. It's like a character trait. You are or you aren't. So if I'm not smart in math, that's the cards I got dealt. Okay. But, but the core belief is I'll never be able to do math. See that? So that one really resonated with me a lot. Why? I believe that. By seventh grade, I was convinced I could not do math. So what have I done for a career? First I asked, what degree can I get in college that requires the least amount of math? <laughs> True story, psychology. I got a psychology degree. Yeah. And then I wanted uh, a graduate degree because a bachelor's in psychology is hard to find jobs that pay you much except as a bartender, which you use your psychology a lot. <laughs> And so I said, well, what graduate degree is out there that, that, you know, I could do the people work I like but doesn't take a lot of math? Social work. Sign me up. Master's degree is social work. Then I wanted a doctorate level degree, but I didn't want to take, right, uh, the GMAT, it's called, because uh, too much math on the GMAT, the test you take to qualify. So again, I asked, what kind of doctorate level degree can I get that doesn't require math uh, at all, preferably? Oh, that's easy. Law. Sign me up. <laughs> so my academic career is solely based on a belief from seventh grade I was not smart in math. It's powerful and, and many of us have these fixed mindsets she calls them. So when we talk with those words because the brain focuses on what we ask it to focus on so if I keep saying intelligent and I value that or talented and I value that and smart and I value that right that's what I'm gonna focus on so when we continually use those words um, that's what gets focused on. If I believe I'm not smart in a certain area, then uh, that's going to be an association that gets really strong in, in what I build. And the problem is kids who are told they are smart all the time, talented and intelligent, uh, suffer as much as kids who are told they're not. Why? Because if I'm talented in math right now, I'm kind of reluctant to go to the next level of math because maybe I won't be as good that, at that level. If I keep pushing myself, maybe all this attention I get because I'm so good in this area won't be there anymore. So I stay static and I don't grow. It overemphasizes the importance of that trait. So she said, look, our kids are going to develop one of two mindsets based on how we talk to them. And I think for children with ADHD, this is more important than maybe any other group of, of children. So this fixed mindset, because why? The context of school, not intelligence or ability to learn, the ability to learn in a traditional school way is the problem. Okay? Not the child's ability to learn or their intelligence. They can, will, do, learn, and grow. 
and develop skills. The issue is the way we have to teach school, and again, I'm not blaming anybody. You've got to teach all the kids at the same time. You've got to teach, right, a whole district worth of kids. You've got to do it in this way that doesn't allow for a lot of flexibility. But I want you to make sure you understand it's the way we do school. Tight limits, lots of sitting, lots of focused concentration, little movement, little creativity, little imagination. Okay, that's the issue. But what's the message that you hear? You're not good at school. You don't learn well. You're always in trouble at school. Your grades aren't good. You might have to be held back a level. Your special education, right? So you get this message really quickly, you're not a good learner, which is not true, which is not true. And then the other message is, look, if I have to work at this at all, it's not worth it. <laughs> because working at it means I'm dumb. I'm dumb in it. Nobody ever told me I was smart in this or smart in that, etc. cetera. And uh, smart means easy, natural. And so think about this a minute. If you think about this with kids that you always tell that they're really smart or really intelligent or really talented, think carefully about when do you do that? You typically start it at a very early age when they do something that looks without effort and natural. Without effort and natural. And this is where the unintentional part comes in because we're hardly paying attention to that. But think about white cow drink. If every time I do something that looks natural, feels automatic, I can just do it, I get this praise heaped on me about how smart, intelligent, and talented I am, what do I come to believe about what smart, intelligent, and talented mean? It means easy, no effort, and automatic. So when I first have to work at something, I'm going, oh, 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 not smart, talented, intelligent there. See it? It's different than intent. Our intent is good, but we build this fixed trait because if I make a mistake, guys, it's because of me. It's my character. It's my trait. It's my fault. What's the other one? The one we want, how our brain really works, called the growth mindset. And so the idea here is it's a process. And the process involves three things. Strategy, effort, sticking with it. Strategy, effort, sticking with it. Those three things. That's what you want to focus your praise on. That's what you want to focus your praise on. Not on talented or intelligent, etc., but on hard work, sticking with it, and giving it your best effort. Now remember, we're going to layer those efforts. We're not going to exhaust them. Effort doesn't mean I'm at my homework desk for 90 minutes at a time. I'm still going to layer. But while I'm doing my homework, I'm going to give it as much effort as I do my video game or my soccer game, uh, et cetera. And the idea here is if I work hard enough, I can learn more, which is true, which is true. OK, so how do we do that? It's how we praise them. So we're looking at strategy acquisition and selection. This is us and the teacher. And a lot of times in these days, it's more and more the teacher. Why? I don't know if you try, have tried to help your kids with homework in high school especially. I can't do some of that stuff. It's a whole different world. So it really relies heavily on the teacher to do what? Strategy acquisition. So a kid who continually is failing at a particular content area needs a different strategy, a different way to either understand or use the material that's going to work. Okay, is going to work. Why? <laughs> if they have the right strategy, kids will use it. Just like you would in your job. If you had to do a job and you were struggling with it and somebody gave you a strategy that works to do it, you would use it, wouldn't you? And it, if it works, you'd use it again and again and again. You wouldn't say, well, I've got this really good strategy, but today, nah, I'm not going to use it. That'd be crazy, right? Same thing with kids. If they have the strategy, they'll use it. But we often go really fast to you're not working hard enough or you don't care, you're not motivated, when what's really going on is they don't have the strategy they need to do the problem, finish the homework, write the paper, et cetera. And then hard work is good. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to work hard. And it brings a lot of benefits to us and pride to us. And then sticking with it despite interruptions, in our world, distractions. And distractions are OK. Let's just get back. To the work. All right, we got distracted. Let's get back to the work. No amygdala voices and every distraction's a big deal. Let's just get back to the work. So any of you that practice mindfulness know exactly what this is like. It's exactly like mindfulness. What do you do? You focus on your breath and then you get distracted. You bring yourself back. But sometimes with our kids, 
when we're asking them to focus, they get a little distracted and we kind of freak out, right? And immediately go to the negative. It's okay, just remind them. Let's get back from the distraction and, and focus. Okay, so motivate the child to repeat the behavior being praised. You will build habits. I'm, I'm gonna finish and I'll answer your question afterward, if that's okay, just because I'm two minutes away. So you've gotta deliver praise, practical, concrete. It's beautiful how this works, really beautiful. So, examples. Start with strategy acquisition and selection. Instead of, um, great job on your math, glad to see you got it done, and excellent grade. All right? That is wasted. Instead, I like the way you tried a lot of different solutions on that math problem until you finally got it. Can the child or student repeat that behavior? Yes. When I get stuck next time, I try a new strategy. I apply a new strategy. Dweck's language is there, my language is in parentheses. Why? I actually like strategies better than solutions. I don't think we talk to kids enough about strategies. Life is about strategies. And when you start using that word, uh, strategies, they'll begin looking for strategies and they'll see them everywhere. There's a strategy for your first date. There's a strategy for getting your driver's license, right? There's a strategy for starting a podcast. Everything's strategy, but we seldom use that word with them. Start using it, and they'll start seeing it and asking about it. All right, how about the effort? You worked many hours on that science project. While most of your friends were Facebooking and watching The Voice, you spent your time on your project. That level, will, that level of effort will be your great success. So now what we've said is we've told them exactly the distraction that they put off in order to do the thing they should have done. So remember extraordinary mental health, it's right there. That's the number one requirement. To have really good mental health is the ability to make yourself do things when you want to do other things. Okay? And that's a way to praise that gets you that, that gets you that. Lastly, that was a hard English assignment. Oh, that was a hard English assignment, but you stuck with it till you got it done. What does stuck with it mean? You stayed at your desk and you kept your concentration. Okay, or whatever it is they did. But notice how concrete it is so it can be repeated. So it can be repeated. And this will help build those habits that are natural, that become natural and become automatic. And using all uh, of our praise in, in a very effective way uh, to help them grow. So uh, she has a, a great website, Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K. And here she says, this is what us adults say that builds that fixed mindset, and this is how we can say it differently. Um, and I, I love this um, the best because uh, this is what I always got told. Great effort, Frank, on math. You did your best. You did your best. But here was the problem. Mrs. Townley, my fourth grade teacher is when this started, right? Math gets a little tougher. Here was the problem. Mrs. Townley would tell me I did my best, then she'd give me a, uh, the paper with the D on it. <laughs> Frank, you did your best, D, you did your best, D, keep doing your best, D, keep doing your best, D. What's the only thing I can believe? My best is a D, see it? Telling me I did my best is no help. She never gave me the strategies. She never saw that I was losing strategy. She never figured out where was the issue. And so telling kids just to do your best, really caution, telling them to do their best, of course, makes sense, but when that's your primary motivator, it doesn't go very far because you're going to frustrate me to no end if I don't have the strategy. And I can't succeed without the strategy even if I work hard and stick with it. See that? If I don't have the strategy, it's all failure, so then I come not to believe you. I come not to believe you because you keep telling me if you work hard and you stick with it, you're going to learn this. No, that's not true. I've got to have the right strategy. I've got to be able to understand an algebra formula to be able to right, pass an algebra test. And if I don't stand, understand the formula and how it works, I could work till the live long day and it's not gonna make any difference. So I always say be careful with just telling kids, just telling kids do their best because it can be frustrating to them uh, unintentionally by you. And there's our, our famous failures. So just like ADHD, there are people who have tremendous failure histories. Um, some of the most famous people in the world. And so when kids feel like it's all got to be easy or successful or et cetera, not true. Not true. All right, we would try that. There's mindset. There's the book. 
But if you would, because we're out of time, if you would make sure you pulled out your um, evaluation, I will get to the slide where if you want this PowerPoint, you can get it by just emailing me and we will let you get on with your Saturday. But you'll see some things in there like hope, um, some good books to use, how to help with organizational skills. Oh, can I show you this real quick? This is the homework suite. You like that term? Homework suite. First time I said that in one of these workshops, I heard a parent in the front row, she goes, sweet my you know what. I'm like, can you get no sweet, <laughs> right? But you go to Target and see these things, these bins, you can do them by threes or you can do them by fives. And, and uh, I just set it up on the shelf, but imagine this is the dining room table or wherever your child is doing homework. You set this up like this and they've got, you, you've just blocked 85% of the distraction around them, right? And they put their little, uh, clock up on top or they can put a little uh, you know something they like you know that's friendly to them on top make it on their own little desk space and it comes down and collapses real easy uh, into one bin you know if you have four or five bins and 85 percent of the visual distraction is taken away uh, just by doing that simple thing and four or five of those bins is less than twenty dollars it's a great investment. And then uh, what we did with Josh, the kid that was making his bed, those bins went, his house with the kitchen, there was a kitchen door right out into the garage. Those bins just went right around the door. And when it was homework time, he took out the bins, he set it up, he had his own certain way of doing things and what he wanted on each shelf. And he took a great deal of pride in his little homework suite. And then it came down really fast. Um, and very effective in helping him with his homework. So there's, there's lots of stuff in there like that um i just got to find i put this in here about how to get it oh gosh i didn't get to that too you'll see these quotes about kids who talk about what it's like to have adhd and and they're heart-wrenching i love james bribery works he says Bribe me, that'll work. <laughs> and then I love this one too. My problem is I say it before I think it. <laughs> and then one for a parent. But I get distracted again. If you email me at this address, put in ADHD in the subject line. You don't even have to send me a nice email. ADHD in the subject line, I'll send you the PowerPoint. And it's just my last name at my organization, upside down organization, dot O-R-G. There we go. Send me an email, I'll, I'll send you it all and hopefully you'll find additional things uh, that you like. Thanks for sharing part of your Saturday with me. Best wishes to all of you. Yeah, we didn't get to the empathy card and, and how it works. I probably had the, I had the whole six hour business so we got through about half of it. So. Um, Maybe we can come back and do it again sometime. Thank you all very much for being here. I really appreciate you coming.